Chapter Fifteen of Pele the Conqueror, Volume One, by Martin Anderson Nexo, translated by Jesse Muir. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. She must have had right on her side, for he never said a cross word when she started off with her complaints and reproaches, and them so loud that you could hear them right through the walls, and down in the servants' room, and all over the farm. But it was stupid of her all the same, for she only drove him distracted and sent him away. And how will it go with a farm in the long run, when the farmer spends all his time on the high roads because he can't stay at home? It's a poor sort of affection that drives the man away from his home. Lasse was standing in the stable on Sunday evening, talking to the women about it while they milked. Pelle was there, too, busy with his own affairs, but listening to what was said. "'But she wasn't altogether stupid, either,' said Thatcher Holmes' wife. "'For instance, when she had fair Maria in to do the housemaid's work, so that he could have a pretty face to look at at home, she knew that if you have food at home you don't go out for it. But of course it all led to nothing.' when she couldn't leave off frightening him out of the house with her crying and her drinking. "'I'm sure he drinks, too,' said Pelle shortly. "'Yes, of course he gets drunk now and then,' said Lasse in a reproving tone. "'But he's a man, you see, and may have his reasons besides. But it's ill when a woman takes to drinking.' Lasse was cross. The boy was beginning to have opinions of his own pretty well on everything, and was always joining in when grown people were talking. "'I maintain,' he went on, turning again to the women, "'that he'd be a good husband, if only he wasn't worried with crying and a bad conscience. Things go pretty well, too, when he's away. He's at home pretty well every day, and looks after things himself, so that the bailiff's quite upset.' for he likes to be king of the castle. To all of us, the master's like one of ourselves. He's even forgotten a grudge he had against Gustav. There can't be very much to bear him a grudge for, unless it's that he'll get a wife with money. They say Bodil saved more than a hundred kronas from her two or three months as housemaid. Some people can. They get paid for what the rest of us have always had to do for nothing. It was one of the old women who spoke. "'Well, we'll just see whether he ever gets her for a wife. I doubt it myself. One oughtn't to speak evil of one's fellow-servant, but Bodil's not a faithful girl. That matter with the master must go for what it was. As I once said to Gustav when he was raging about it, the master comes before his men. Bengta was a good wife to me in every way.' but she was very fond of laying herself out for the landlord at home. The greatest take first, that's the way of the world. But Bodil's never of the same mind for long together. Now she's carrying on with the pupil, though he's not sixteen yet, and takes presents from him. Gustav should get out of it in time. It always leads to misfortune when love gets into a person. We've got an example of that at the farm here. I was talking to someone the other day who thought that the mistress hadn't gone to Copenhagen at all, but was with relations in the South. She's run away from him, you'll see. That's the genteel thing to do nowadays, it seems, said Lasse. If only she'll stay away. Things are much better as they are. An altogether different atmosphere seemed to fill Stone Farm. The dismal feeling was gone. No wailing tones came from the house, and settled upon one like horseflies and black care. The change was most apparent in the farmer. He looked ten or twenty years younger, and joked good-humouredly like one freed from chains and fetters. He took an interest in the work of the farm, drove to the quarry two or three times a day in his gig, was present whenever a new piece of work was started and would often throw off his coat and take a hand in it. Fair Maria laid his table and made his bed, and he was not afraid of showing his kindness for her. His good humor was infectious and made everything pleasanter. 
but it could not be denied that Lasse had his own burden to bear. His anxiety to get married grew greater with the arrival of very cold weather as early as December. He longed to have his feet under his own table and have a woman to himself who should be everything to him. He had not entirely given up thoughts of Karna yet, but he had promised Thatcher Holmes' wife ten kronas down if she could find someone that would do for him. He had really put the whole matter out of his head as an impossibility, and had passed into the land of old age. But what was the use of shutting yourself in, when you were all the time looking for doors through which to slip out again? Lasse looked out once more, and as usual it was Pelle who brought life and joy to the house. Down in the outskirts of the fishing village there lived a woman whose husband had gone to sea and had not been heard of for a good many years. Two or three times on his way to and from school, Pelle had sought shelter from the weather in her porch, and they had gradually become good friends. He performed little services for her and received a cup of hot coffee in return. When the cold was very bitter, she always called him in, and then she would tell him about the sea and about her good-for-nothing husband, who kept away and left her to toil for her living by mending nets for the fishermen. In return, Pelle felt bound to tell her about Father Lasse and Mother Bengta, who lay at home in the churchyard at Tomalila. The talk never came to much more, for she always returned to her husband, who had gone away and left her a widow. "'I suppose he's drowned,' Pelle would say. "'No, he isn't, for I've had no warning,' she answered decidedly, always in the same words. Pelle repeated it all to his father, who was very much interested. "'Well, did you run in to Madame Olsen today?' was the first thing he said when the boy came in from school, and then Pelle had to tell him every detail several times over. It could never be too circumstantially told for Lasse. "'You've told her, I suppose, that Mother Bengta's dead. Yes, of course you have. Well, what did she ask about me today? Does she know about the legacy?' Lasse had recently had twenty-five kronas left him by an uncle. You might very well let fall a word or two about that, so that she shouldn't think we're quite paupers. Pelle was the bearer of ambiguous messages backward and forward. From Lasse he took little things in return for her kindness to himself, such as embroidered handkerchiefs and a fine silk kerchief, the last remnants of Mother Bengta's effects. It would be hard to lose them if this new chance failed for then there would be no memories to fall back upon. But Lasse staked everything upon one card. One day Pelle brought word that warning had come to Madame Olsen. She had been awakened in the night by a big black dog that stood gasping at the head of her bed. Its eyes shone in the darkness, and she heard the water dripping from its fur. She understood that it must be the ship's dog with a message for her and went to the window, and out in the moonlight on the sea she saw a ship sailing with all sail set. She stood high, and you could see the sea and sky right through her. Over the bulwark hung her husband and the others, and they were transparent, and the salt water was dripping from their hair and beards and running down the side of the ship. In the evening Lasse put on his best clothes. "'Are we going out this evening?' asked Pelle, in glad surprise. "'No, well, that's to say I am, just a little errand. If anyone asks after me, you must say I've gone to the smith about a new nose-ring for the bull.' "'And mayn't I go with you?' asked Pelle on the verge of tears. "'No, you must be good and stay at home for this once.' Lasse patted him on the head. "'Where are you going, then?' I'm going. Lasse was about to make up a lie about it, but had not the heart to do it. You mustn't ask me, he said. Shall I know another day, then, without asking? Yes, you shall, for certain, sure. Lasse went out, but came back again. 
Pelle was sitting on the edge of the bed, crying. It was the first time Father Lasse had gone out without taking him with him. "'Now you must be a good boy and go to bed,' he said gravely. "'Or else I shall stay at home with you. But if I do, it may spoil things for us both.' So Pelle thought better of it and began to undress, and at last Lasse got off. When Lasse reached Madame Olsen's house, it was shut up and in darkness. He recognized it easily from Pelle's descriptions, and walked round it two or three times to see how the walls stood. Both timber and plaster looked good, and there was a fair-sized piece of ground belonging to it, just big enough to allow of its being attended to on Sundays, so that one could work for a daily wage on weekdays. Lasse knocked at the door, and a little while after a white form appeared at the window and asked who was there. "'It's Pelle's father, Lasse Carlson,' said Lasse, stepping out into the moonlight. The door was unbolted, and a soft voice said, "'Come inside. Don't stand out there in the cold.' And Lasse stepped over the threshold. There was a smell of sleep in the room, and Lasse had an idea where the alcove was, but could see nothing. He heard the breathing as of a stout person drawing on stockings. Then she struck a match and lighted the lamp. They shook hands and looked at one another as they did so. She wore a skirt of striped bed-ticking, which kept her night-jacket together, and had a blue nightcap on her head. She had strong-looking limbs and a good bust, and her face gave a good impression. She was the kind of woman that would not hurt a fly if she were not put upon, but she was not a toiler, she was too soft for that. "'So this is Pelle's father,' she said. "'It's a young son you've got, but do sit down.' Lasse blinked his eyes a little. He had been afraid that she would think him old. "'Yes, he's what you might call a late-born child, but I'm still able to do a man's work, in more ways than one.' She laughed while she busied herself in placing on the table cold bacon and pork sausage, a dram, bread, and a saucer of dripping. "'But now you must eat,' she said. "'That's what a man's known by, and you've come a long way.' It only now occurred to Lasse that he must give some excuse for his visit. "'I ought really to be going again at once. I only wanted to come down and thank you for your kindness to the boy.' He even got up, as if to go. "'Oh, but what nonsense!' she exclaimed, pushing him down into his chair again. "'It's very plain, but do take some.' She pressed the knife into his hand, and eagerly pushed the food in front of him. Her whole person radiated warmth and kind-heartedness as she stood close to him and attended to his wants, and Lasse enjoyed it all. You must have been a good wife to your husband, he said. Yes, that's true enough, she said, as she sat down and looked frankly at him. He got all that he could want, and almost more, when he was on shore. He stayed in bed until dinner, and I looked after him like a little child, but he never gave me a hand's turn for it, and at last one gets tired. That was wrong of him, said Lasse for one good action deserves another. I don't think Bengta would have anything like that to say of me, if she was asked. Well, there's certainly plenty to do in a house, when there's a man that has the will to help. I've only one cow, of course, for I can't manage more. But two might very well be kept, and there's no debt on the place. I'm only a poor devil compared to you, said Lasse despondently. Altogether I've got fifty kronas, and we both have decent clothes to put on. But beyond that, I've only got a pair of good hands. And I'm sure that's worth a good deal. And I should fancy you're not afraid of fetching a pail of water, or that sort of thing, are you? No, I'm not. And I'm not afraid of a cup of coffee in bed on a Sunday morning, either. She laughed. Then I suppose I ought to have a kiss, she said. "'Yes, I suppose you ought,' said Lasse, delighted, and kissed her. "'And now we may hope for happiness and a blessing for all three of us,' 
I know you're fond of the laddie. There still remained several things to discuss. There was coffee to be drunk, and Lasse had to see the cow and the way the house was arranged. In the meantime, it had grown late. You'd better stay here for the night, said Madame Olsen. Lasse stood wavering. There was the boy sleeping alone, and he had to be at the farm by four o'clock. But it was cold outside, and here it was so warm and comfortable in every way. Yes, perhaps I'd better, he said, laying down his hat and coat again. When at about four he crept into the cow stable from the back, the lantern was still burning in the herdsman's room. Lasse thought he was discovered and began to tremble. It was a criminal and unjustifiable action to be away from the herd a whole night. But it was only Pelle, who lay huddled up upon the chest asleep with his clothes on. His face was black and swollen with crying. All that day there was something reserved, almost hostile, about Pelle's behavior, and Lasse suffered under it. There was nothing for it. He must speak out. It's all settled now, Pelle, he said at last. We're going to have a house and home, and a nice-looking mother into the bargain. It's Madame Olsen. Are you satisfied now? Pelle had nothing against it. Then I may come with you next time, he asked, still a little sullen. Yes, next time you shall go with me. I think it'll be on Sunday. We'll ask leave to go out early and pay her a visit. Lasse said this with a peculiar flourish. He had become more erect. Pelle went with him on Sunday. They were free from the middle of the afternoon. But after that it would not have done to ask for leave very soon again. Pelle saw his future mother nearly every day, but it was more difficult for Lasse. When the longing to see his sweetheart came over him too strongly, he fussed over Pelle until the boy fell asleep and then changed his clothes and stole out. After a wakeful night such as one of these, he was not up to his work, and went about stumbling over his own feet, but his eyes shone with a youthful light, as if he had concluded a secret treaty with life's most powerful forces. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of Pele the Conqueror, Volume One, by Martin Anderson Nexo, translated by Jesse Muir. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eric was standing on the front steps, with stooping shoulders and face half turned toward the wall. He stationed himself there every morning at about four, and waited for the bailiff to come down. It was now six, and had just begun to grow light. Lasse and Pelle had finished cleaning out the cow stable and distributing the first feed, and they were hungry. They were standing at the door of the stable, waiting for the breakfast bell to ring, and at the doors of the horse stables the men were doing the same. At a quarter past the hour they went toward the basement, with Karl Johann at their head, and Lasse and Pelle also turned out and hurried to the servant's room, with every sign of a good appetite. "'Now, Eric, we're going down to breakfast,' shouted Karl Johann as they passed. And Eric came out of his corner by the steps and shuffled along after them. There was nothing the matter with his digestive powers, at any rate. They ate their herring in silence. The food stopped their mouths completely. When they had finished, the head man knocked on the table with the handle of his knife, and Karna came in with two dishes of porridge and a pile of bread and dripping. "'Where's Bodil today?' asked Gustav. "'How should I know? Her bed was standing untouched this morning,' answered Karna with an exulting look. "'It's a lie,' cried Gustav, bringing down his spoon with a bang upon the table. "'You can go into her room and see for yourself. You know the way,' said Karna tartly. And what's become of the pupil today, as he hasn't rung? Have any of you girls seen him? No, I expect he's overslept himself, cried Bengta from the wash-house. And so he may. I don't want to run up and shake him into life every morning. Don't you think you'd better go and wake him up, Gustav? said Anders with a wink, 
You might see something funny. The others laughed a little. If I wake him, it'll be with this rabbit skinner, answered Gustav, exhibiting a large knife. For then I think I should put him out of harm's way. At this point, the farmer himself came down. He held a piece of paper in his hand and appeared to be in a high good humor. Have you heard the latest news, good people? At dead of night, Hans Peter has eloped with Bodil. My word! Are the babes and sucklings beginning now? exclaimed Lasse with self-assurance. I shall have to look after Pelle there and see that he doesn't run away with Karna. She's fond of young people. Lasse felt himself to be the man of the company and was not afraid of giving a hit at any one. Hans Peter is fifteen, said Kongstrup reprovingly, and passion rages in his heart. He said this with such comical gravity that they all burst into laughter, except Gustav, who sat blinking his eyes and nodding his head like a drunken man. You shall hear what he says. This lay upon his bed. Kongstrup held the paper out in a theatrical attitude and read, When you read this, I shall have gone forever. Bodil and I have agreed to run away tonight. My stern father will never give his consent to our union, and therefore we will enjoy the happiness of our love in a secret place where no one can find us. It will be doing a great wrong to look for us, for we have determined to die together rather than fall into the wicked hands of our enemies. I wet this paper with Bodil's and my own tears. But you must not condemn me for my last desperate step, as I can do nothing else for the sake of my great love. Hans Peter. That fellow reads storybooks, said Karl Johann. He'll do great things some day. Yes, he knows exactly what's required for an elopement, answered Kongstrup merrily. Even to a ladder, which he's dragged up to the girl's window, although it's on a level with the ground. I wish he were only half as thorough in his agriculture. What's to be done now? I suppose they must be searched for, asked the head man. Well, I don't know. It's almost a shame to disturb their young happiness. They'll come of their own accord when they get hungry. What do you think, Gustav? Shall we organize a battue? Gustav made no answer, but rose abruptly and went across to the men's rooms. When the others followed him, they found him in bed. All day he lay there, and never uttered a syllable when any one came in to him. Meanwhile the work suffered, and the bailiff was angry. He did not at all like the new way Kongstrup was introducing, with liberty for everyone to say and do exactly as they liked. "'Go in and pull Gustav out of bed,' he said, in the afternoon, when they were in the threshing barn, winnowing grain and if he won't pull his own clothes on, dress him by force. But Kongstrup, who was there himself, entering the wait, interfered. No, if he's ill, he must be allowed to keep his bed, he said. But it's our duty to do something to cure him. How about a mustard plaster? suggested Mons, with a defiant glance at the bailiff. Kongstrup rubbed his hands with delight. Yes, that'll be splendid, he said. Go you across, Mons, and get the girls to make a mustard plaster that we can stick on the pit of his stomach. That's where the pain is. When Mons came back with the plaster, they went up in a procession to put it on, the farmer himself leading. Kongstrup was well aware of the bailiff's angry looks, which plainly said, Another waste of work for the sake of a foolish prank. But he was inclined for a little fun, and the work would get done somehow. Gustav smelled a rat for when they arrived he was dressed. For the rest of the day he did his work, but nothing could draw a smile out of him. He was like a man moonstruck. A few days later a cart drove up to Stone Farm. In the driving seat sat a broad-shouldered farmer in a fur coat, and beside him, wrapped up from head to foot, sat Hans Peter, while at the back, on the floor of the cart, lay the pretty Bodo on a little hay shivering with cold. It was the pupil's father who had brought back the two fugitives, whom he had found in lodgings in the town. Up in the office Hans Peter received a thrashing that could be heard, and was then led out into the yard, where he wandered about, crying and ashamed, until he began to play with Pelle behind the cow-stable. 
Bodil was treated more severely. It must have been the strange farmer who insisted that she should be instantly dismissed, for Kongstrup was not usually a hard man. She had to pack her things, and after dinner was driven away. She looked good and gentle as she always did. One would have thought she was a perfect angel, if one had not known better. Next morning Gustav's bed was empty. He had vanished completely, with chest, wooden shoes, and everything. Lasse looked on at all this with a man's indulgent smile, children's tricks. All that was wanting now was that Karna should squeeze her fat body through the basement window one night, and she too disappear like smoke, on the hunt for Gustav. This did not happen, however, and she became kindly disposed toward Lasse again, saw after his and Pelle's clothes, and tried to make them comfortable. Lasse was not blind. He saw very well which way the wind blew, and enjoyed the consciousness of his power. There were now two that he could have whenever he pleased. He only had to stretch out his hand, and the women folk snatched at it. He went about all day in a state of joyful intoxication, and there were days in which he was in such an elevated condition of mind that he had inward promptings to make use of his opportunity. He had always trodden his path in this world so sedately, done his duty, and lived his life in such unwavering decency. Why should not he, too, for once, let things go, and try to leap through the fiery hoops? There was a tempting development of power in the thought. But the uprightness in him triumphed. He had always kept to the one, as the scriptures commanded, and he would continue to do so. The other thing was only for the great, Abraham, of whom Pelle had begun to tell him, and Kongstrup. Pelle, too, must never be able to say anything against his father in that way. He must be clean in his child's eyes, and be able to look him in the face without shrinking. And then, well, the thought of how the two women would take it in the event of it being discovered, simply made Lasse blink his red eyes and hang his head. Toward the middle of March, Fru Kongstrup returned unexpectedly. The farmer was getting along very comfortably without her, and her coming took him rather by surprise. Fair Maria was instantly turned out, and sent down to the wash-house. Her not being sent away altogether was due to the fact that there was a shortage of maids at the farm now that Bodil had left. The mistress had brought a young relative with her, who was to keep her company and help her in the house. They appeared to get on very well together. Kongstrup stayed at home upon the farm and was steady. The three drove out together and the mistress was always hanging on his arm when they went about showing the place to the young lady. It was easy to see why she had come home. She could not live without him. But Kongstrup did not seem to be nearly so pleased about it. He had put away his high spirits and retired into his shell once more. When he was going about like this, he often looked as if there was something invisible lying in ambush for him, and he was afraid to be taken unawares. This invisible something reached out after the others, too. Fru Kongstrup never interfered unkindly in anything, either directly or in a roundabout way, and yet everything became stricter. People no longer moved freely about the yard, but glanced up at the tall windows and hurried past. The atmosphere had once more that oppression about it that makes one feel slack and upset and depressed. Mystery once more hung heavy over the roof of Stone Farm. To many generations it had stood for prosperity or misfortune. These had been its foundations, and still it drew to itself the constant thoughts of many people. Dark things, terror, dreariness, vague suspicions of evil powers, gathered there naturally as in a churchyard. And now it all centered round this woman whose shadow was so heavy that everything brightened when she went away. Her unceasing, wailing protest against her wrongs spread darkness round and brought weariness with it. It was not even with the idea of submitting to the inevitable that she came back, but only to go on as before, with renewed strength. She could not do without him, but neither could she offer him anything good. She was like those beings who can live and breathe only in fire, 
and yet cry out when burnt. She writhed in the flames, and yet she herself fed them. Fair Maria was her own doing, and now she had brought this new relative into the house. Thus she herself made easy the path of his infidelity, and then shook the house above him with her complaining. An affection such as this was not God's work. Powers of evil had their abode in her. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of Pele the Conqueror, Volume One, by Martin Anderson Nexo, translated by Jesse Muir. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oh, how bitterly cold it was! Pele was on his way to school, leaning in a jog trot against the wind. At the big thorn, Rude was standing waiting for him. He fell in, and they ran side by side like two blown nags, breathing hard and with heads hanging low. Their coat collars were turned up about their ears, and their hands pushed into the tops of their trousers to share the warmth of their bodies. The sleeves of Pelle's jacket were too short, and his wrists were blue with cold. They said little, but only ran. The wind snatched the words from their mouths and filled them with hail. It was hard enough to get breath to run with or to keep an eye open. Every other minute they had to stop and turn their back to the wind, while they filled their lungs and breathed warm breath up over their faces to bring feeling into them. The worst part of it was the turning back, before they got quite up against the wind and into step again. The four miles came to an end, and the boys turned into the village. Down here by the shore it was almost sheltered. The rough sea broke the wind. There was not much of the sea to be seen. What did appear here and there, through the rifts in the squalls, came on like a moving wall, and broke with a roar into whitish-green foam. The wind tore the top off the waves in ill-tempered snatches, and carried salt rain in over the land. The master had not yet arrived. Up at his desk stood Nylon, busily picking its lock to get at a pipe that Fries had confiscated during lessons. "'Here's your knife!' he cried, throwing a sheath-knife to Pelle, who quickly pocketed it. Some peasant boys were pouring coal into the stove, which was already red-hot. By the window sat a crowd of girls, hearing one another in hymns. Outside the waves broke without ceasing, and when their roar sank for a moment, the shrill voices of boys rose into the air. All the boys of the village were on the beach, running in and out under the breakers that looked as if they would crush them, and pulling driftwood upon shore. Pelle had hardly thawed himself when Nylon made him go out with him. Most of the boys were wet through, but they were laughing and panting with eagerness. One of them had brought in the name-board of a ship. The simplicity was painted on it. They stood round it and wrangled about what kind of vessel it was and what was its home port. "'Then the ship's gone down,' said Pelle gravely. The others did not answer it. It was so self-evident. "'Well,' said a boy hesitatingly, "'the name-board may have been torn away by the waves. It's only been nailed on.' They examined it carefully again. Pelle could not discover anything special about it. "'I rather think the crew have torn it off and thrown it into the sea. One of the nails has been pulled out,' said Nylon, nodding with an air of mystery. "'But why should they do that?' asked Pelle, with incredulity. "'Because they've killed the captain and taken over the command themselves, you ass. Then all they've got to do is christen the ship again and sail as pirates.' The other boys confirmed this with eyes that shone with the spirit of adventure. This one's father had told him about it, and that one's had even played a part in it. He did not want to, of course. But then he was tied to the mast while the mutiny was in progress. On a day like this, Pelle felt small in every way. The raging of the sea oppressed him and made him feel insecure. But the others were in their element. They possessed themselves of all the horror of the ocean, and represented it in an exaggerated form. They heaped up all the terrors of the sea, 
in play upon the shore. Ships went to the bottom with all on board, or struck on the rocks. Corpses lay rolling in the surf, and drowned men in sea-boots and sou'westers came up out of the sea at midnight, and walked right into the little cottages in the village to give warning of their departure. They dwelt upon it with a seriousness that was bright with inward joy, as though they were singing hymns of praise to the mighty ocean. But Pelle stood outside all this, and felt himself cowardly when listening to their tales. He kept behind the others, and wished he could bring down the big bull and let it loose among them. Then they would come to him for protection. The boys had orders from their parents to take care of themselves. For Marta, the old skipper's widow, had three nights running, heard the sea demand corpses with a short bark. They talked about that, too, and about when the fishermen would venture out again, while they ran about the beach. "'A bottle! A bottle!' cried one of them suddenly, dashing off along the shore. He was quite sure he had seen a bottle bob up out of the surf a little way off and disappear again. The whole swarm stood for a long time, gazing eagerly out into the seething foam, and Kylan and another boy had thrown off their jackets to be ready to jump out when it appeared again. The bottle did not appear again, but it had given a spur to the imagination, and every boy had his own solemn knowledge of such things. Just now, during the equinoctial storms, many a bottle went over a ship's side with a last message to those on land. Really and truly, of course, that was why you learned to write, so as to be able to write your message when your hour came. Then perhaps the bottle would be swallowed by a shark, or perhaps it would be fished up by stupid peasants, who took it home with them to their wives to put drink into, this last a good-natured hit at Pelle. But it sometimes happened that it drifted ashore, just at the place it was meant for, and, if not, it was the finder's business to take it to the nearest magistrate, if he didn't want to lose his right hand. Out in the harbor the waves broke over the mole. The fishermen had drawn their boats up on shore. They could not rest indoors, in their warm cottages. The sea and bad weather kept them on the beach night and day. They stood in shelter behind their boats, yawning heavily and gazing out to sea, where now and then a sail fluttered past like a storm-beaten bird. "'In, in!' cried the girls from the schoolroom door, and the boys sauntered slowly up. Fries was walking backward and forward in front of his desk, smoking his pipe with the picture of the king on it, and with the newspaper sticking out of his pocket. "'To your places!' he shouted, striking his desk with the cane. "'Is there any news?' asked a boy, when they had taken their places. Free sometimes read aloud the shipping news to them. "'I don't know,' answered Fries crossly. "'You can get out your slates and arithmetics.' "'Oh, we're going to do sums. Oh, that's fun.' The whole class was rejoicing audibly as they got out their things. Fries did not share the children's delight over arithmetic. His gifts, he was accustomed to say, were of a purely historical nature. But he accommodated himself to their needs, because long experience had taught him that a pandemonium might easily arise on a stormy day such as this. The weather had a remarkable influence upon the children. His own knowledge extended only as far as Christian Hansen's Part I, but there were two peasant boys who had worked on by themselves into Part Three, and they helped the others. The children were deep in their work, their long, regular breathing rising and falling in the room like a deep sleep. There was a continual passing backward and forward to the two arithmeticians, and the industry was only now and then interrupted by some little piece of mischief that came over one or another of the children as a reminder, but they soon fell into order again. At the bottom of the class there was a sound of sniffing, growing more and more distinct. Fries laid down his newspaper impatiently. Peter's crying, said those nearest. Oh ho, said Fries, peering over his spectacles. What's the matter now? He says he can't remember what twice two is. 
Fries forced the air through his nostrils and seized the cane, but thought better of it. Twice two's five, he said quietly, at which there was a laugh at Peter's expense, and work went on again. For some time they worked diligently, and then Nylon rose. Fries saw it, but went on reading. Which is the lightest, a pound of feathers or a pound of lead? I can't find it in the answers. Fries's hands trembled as he held the paper up close to his face to see something or other better. It was his mediocrity as a teacher of arithmetic that the imps were always aiming at, but he would not be drawn into a discussion with them. Nylon repeated the question, while the others tittered, but Fries did not hear. He was too deep in his paper. So the whole thing dropped. Fries looked at his watch. He could soon give them a quarter of an hour's play, a good long quarter of an hour. Then there would be only one little hour's worry left, and that school day could be laid by as another trouble got through. Pelle stood up in his place in the middle of the class. He had some trouble to keep his face in the proper folds, and had to pretend that his neighbors were disturbing him. At last he got out what he wanted to say, but his ears were a little red at the tips. If a pound of flour costs twelve oras, what will half a quarter of coal cost? Fries sat for a little while and looked irresolutely at Pelle. It always hurt him more when Pelle was naughty than when it was one of the others, for he had an affection for the boy. Very well, he said bitterly, coming slowly down with the thick cane in his hand. Very well. Look out for yourself, whispered the boys, preparing to put difficulties in the way of Fries's approach. But Pelle did one of those things that were directly opposed to all recognized rules, and yet gained him respect. Instead of shielding himself from the thrashing, he stepped forward and held out both hands with the palms turned upward. His face was crimson. Fries looked at him in surprise and was inclined to do anything but beat him. The look in Pelle's eyes rejoiced his heart. He did not understand boys as boys, but with regard to human beings, his perceptions were fine, and there was something human here. It would be wrong not to take it seriously. He gave Pelle a sharp stroke across his hands, and, throwing down the cane, called shortly, Playtime, and turned away. The spray was coming right up to the school wall. A little way out there was a vessel, looking very much battered and at the mercy of the storm. She moved quickly forward a little way and stood still and staggered for a time before moving on again, like a drunken man. She was going in the direction of the southern reef. The boys had collected behind the school to eat their dinner in shelter but suddenly there was the hollow rattling sound of wooden-soled boots over on the shore side, and the coast guard and a couple of fishermen ran out. Then the life-saving apparatus came dashing up, the horses' manes flying in the wind. There was something inspiriting in the pace, and the boys threw down everything and followed. The vessel was now right down by the point. She lay tugging at her anchor, with her stern toward the reef, and the waves washing over her. She looked like an old horse, kicking out viciously at some obstacle with its hind legs. The anchor was not holding, and she was drifting backward onto the reef. There were a number of people on the shore, both from the coast and from inland. The country people must have come down to see whether the water was wet. The vessel had gone aground and lay rolling on the reef. The people on board had managed her like asses, said the fisherman but she was no Russian, but a lap vessel. The waves went right over her from end to end, and the crew had climbed into the rigging, where they hung, gesticulating with their arms. They must have been shouting something, but the noise of the waves drowned it. Pelle's eyes and ears were taking in all the preparations. He was quivering with excitement, and had to fight against his infirmity, which returned whenever anything stirred his blood. The men on the beach were busy driving stakes into the sand to hold the apparatus, and arranging ropes and hawsers so that everything should go smoothly. Special care was bestowed upon the long, fine line that the rocket was to carry out to the vessel. 
alterations were made in it at least twenty times. The foreman of the trained rescue party stood and took aim with the rocket apparatus. His glance darted out and back again to measure the distance with the sharpness of a claw. Ready, said the others, moving to one side. Ready, he answered gravely. For a moment all was still, while he placed it in another position and then back again. Whew! The thin line stood like a quivering snake in the air, with its runaway head boring through the sodden atmosphere over the sea, and its body flying shrieking from the drum and riding out with deep humming tones to cut its way far out through the storm. The rocket had cleared the distance capitally. It was a good way beyond the wreck, but too far to leeward. It had run itself out and now stood wavering in the air like the restless head of a snake while it dropped. "'It's going afore her,' said one fisherman. The others were silent, but from their looks it was evident that they were of the same opinion. "'It may still get there,' said the foreman. The rocket had struck the water a good way to the north, but the line still stood in an arch in the air, held up by the stress. It dropped in long waves toward the south, made a couple of folds in the wind, and dropped gently across the fore part of the vessel. "'That's it! It got there all right!' shouted the boys, and sprang on to the sand. The fishermen stamped about with delight, made a sideways movement with their heads toward the fishermen, and nodded appreciatively at one another. Out on the vessel a man crawled about in the rigging until he got hold of the line, and then crept down into the shrouds to the others again. Their strength could not be up to much, for except for that they did not move. On shore there was activity. The roller was fixed more firmly to the ground, and the cradle made ready. The thin line was knotted to a thicker rope, which again was to draw the heavy hawser on board. It was important that everything should hold. To the hawser was attached a pulley as large as a man's head for the drawing ropes to run in, for one could not know what appliances they would have on board, such as an old tub. For safety's sake, a board was attached to the line, upon which were instructions, in English, to haul it until a hawser of such and such a thickness came on board. This was unnecessary for ordinary people, but one never knew how stupid such fin laps could be. "'They may haul away now as soon as they like, and let us get done with it,' said the foreman, beating his hands together. "'Perhaps they're too exhausted,' said a young fisherman. They must have been through a hard time. They must surely be able to haul in a three-quarter inch rope, fasten an additional line to the rope, so that we can give them a hand in getting the hawser on board when they get so far. This was done. But out on the wreck they hung stupidly in the rigging without ever moving. What in the world were they thinking about? The line still lay, motionless on the sand, but it was not fast to the bottom for it moved when it was tightened by the water. It must have been made fast to the rigging. "'They've made it fast, the blockheads,' said the foreman. "'I suppose they're waiting for us to haul the vessel up on land for them. With that bit of thread—' He laughed in despair. "'I suppose they don't know any better, poor things,' said the Mormon. No one spoke or moved. They were paralyzed by the incomprehensibility of it and their eyes moved in dreadful suspense from the wreck down to the motionless line and back again. The dull horror that ensues when men have done their utmost and are beaten back by absolute stupidity began to creep over them. The only thing the shipwrecked men did was to gesticulate with their arms. They must have thought that the men on shore could work miracles in defiance of them. In an hour it'll all be up with them, said the foreman sadly. It's hard to stand still and look on. A young fisherman came forward. Pelle knew him well, for he had met him occasionally by the cairn, where the baby's soul burned in the summer nights. If one of you'll go with me, I'll try to drift down upon them, said Niels Kohler quietly. It'll be certain death, Niels, said the foreman, laying his hand upon the young man's shoulder. 
You understand that, I suppose. I'm not one to be afraid, but I won't throw away my life. So you know what I think. The others took the same view. A boat would be dashed to pieces against the moles. It would be impossible to get it out of the harbor in this weather, let alone work down to the wreck with wind and waves athwart. It might be that the sea had made a demand upon the village. No one would try to sneak out of his allotted share. But this was downright madness. With Niels Kohler himself it must pass. His position was a peculiar one, with the murder of a child almost on his conscience and his sweetheart in prison. He had his own account to settle with the Almighty. No one ought to dissuade him. "'Then will none of you?' asked Niels, and looked down at the ground. "'Well, then I must try it alone.' He went slowly up the beach. How he was going to set about it, no one knew, nor did he himself. But the spirit had evidently come over him. They stood looking after him. Then a young sailor said slowly, I suppose I'd better go with him and take the one oar. He can do nothing by himself. It was Nyland's brother. It wouldn't sound right if I stopped you from going, my son, said the Mormon. But can two of you do more than one? Niels and I were at school together and have always been friends, answered the young man, looking into his father's face. Then he moved away and a little farther off began to run to catch up Niels. The fishermen looked after them in silence. Youth and madness, one of them said. One blessing is that they'll never be able to get the boat out of the harbor. If I know anything of Carl, they will get the boat out, said the Mormon gloomily. Some time passed, and then a boat appeared on the south side of the harbor, where there was a little shelter. They must have dragged it in over land with the women's help. The harbor projected a little so that the boat escaped the worst of the surf before emerging from its protection. They were working their way out. It was all they could do to keep the boat up against the wind, and they scarcely moved. Every other moment the whole of the inside of the boat was visible, as if it would take nothing to upset it. But that had one advantage, in that the water they shipped ran out again. It was evident that they meant to work their way out so far that they could make use of the high sea and scud down upon the wreck. A desperate idea. But the whole thing was such sheer madness, one would never have thought they had been born and bred by the water. After half an hour's rowing, it seemed they could do no more, and they were not more than a good couple of cable lengths out from the harbor. They lay still one of them holding the boat up to the waves with the oars, while the other struggled with something, a bit of sail as big as a sack. Yes, yes, of course. Now if they took the oars and left themselves at the mercy of the weather, with wind and waves abaft and beam, they would fill with water at once. But they did not take in the oars. One of them sat and kept a frenzied watch while they ran before the wind. It looked very awkward but it was evident that it gave greater command of the boat. Then they suddenly dropped the sail and rowed the boat hard up against the wind when a sea was about to break. None of the fishermen could recollect ever having seen such navigation before. It was young blood, and they knew what they were about. Every instant one felt one must say, Now! But the boat was like a living thing that understood how to meet everything, it always rose above every caprice. The sight made one warm, so that for a time one forgot it was a sail for life or death. Even if they managed to get down to the wreck, what then? Why, they would be dashed against the side of the vessel. Old Ole Kohler, Niels's father, came down over the sandbanks. Who's that out there throwing themselves away? he asked. The question sounded harsh as it broke in upon the silence and suspense. No one looked at him. Ole was rather garrulous. He glanced round the flock, as though he were looking for some particular person. Niels, have any of you seen Niels? He asked quietly. One man nodded toward the sea, and he was silent and overcome. The waves must have broken their oars or carried them away 
for they dropped the bit of sail. The boat burrowed aimlessly with its prow, and settled lazily with its broadside to the wind. Then a great wave took them, and carried them in one long sweep toward the wreck, and they disappeared in the breaking billow. When the water sank to rest, the boat lay bottom upward, rolling in the lee of the vessel. A man was working his way from the deck up into the rigging. "'Isn't that Niels?' said Ole, gazing until his eyes watered. "'I wonder if that isn't Niels.' "'No, it's my brother Carl,' said Nylon. "'Then Niels is gone,' said Ole plaintively. "'Then Niels is gone.' The others had nothing to answer. It was a matter of course that Niels would be lost. Ole stood for a little while shrinkingly, as if expecting someone would say it was Niels. He dried his eyes and tried to make it out for himself, but they only filled again. "'Your eyes are young,' he said to Pelle, his head trembling. "'Can't you see that it's Niels?' "'No, it's Carl,' said Pelle softly. And Ole went with bowed head through the crowd, without looking at anyone or turning aside for anything. He moved as though he were alone in the world, and walked slowly out along the south shore. He was going to meet the dead body. There was no time to think. The line began to be alive, glided out into the sea, and drew the rope after it. Yard after yard it unrolled itself, and glided slowly into the sea, like an awakened sea animal and the thick hawser began to move. Carl fastened it high up on the mast, and it took all the men, and boys too, to haul it taut. Even then it hung in a heavy curve from its own weight, and the cradle dragged through the crests of the waves when it went out empty. It was more under than above the water as they pulled it back again with the first of the crew, a funny little dark man dressed in mangy gray fur, he was almost choked in the crossing. But when once they had emptied the water out of him, he quite recovered, and chattered incessantly in a curious language that no one understood. Five little fur-clad beings, one by one, were brought over by the cradle, and last of all came Carl, with a little squealing pig in his arms. "'They were a poor lot of seamen,' said Carl, in the intervals of disgorging water. Upon my word, they understood nothing. They'd made a rocket line fast to the shrouds and tied the loose end round the captain's waist, and you should just have seen the muddle on board. He talked loudly, but his glance seemed to veil something. The men now went home to the village with the shipwrecked sailors. The vessel looked as if it would keep out of the water for some time. Just as the schoolchildren were starting to go home, Ole came staggering along with his son's dead body on his back. He walked with loose knees bending low and moaning under his burden. Fris stopped him and helped him to lay the dead body in the schoolroom. There was a deep wound in the forehead. When Pelle saw the dead body with its gaping wound, he began to jump up and down, jumping quickly up and letting himself drop like a dead bird. The girls drew away from him screaming, and Fries bent over him and looked sorrowfully at him. "'It isn't from naughtiness,' said the other boys. "'He can't help it. He's taken that way sometimes. He got it once when he saw a man almost killed. And they carried him off to the pump to bring him to himself again. Fries and Ole busied themselves over the dead body, placed something under the head, and washed away the sand that had got rubbed into the skin of the face. He was my best boy, said Fries, stroking the dead man's head with a trembling hand. Look well at him, children, and never forget him. He was my best boy. He stood silent, looking straight before him, with dimmed spectacles and hands hanging loosely. Ole was crying. He had suddenly grown pitiably old and decrepit. I suppose I ought to get him home, he said plaintively trying to raise his son's shoulders, but he had not the strength. "'Just let him lie,' said Fries. "'He's had a hard day, and he's resting now.' "'Yes, he's had a hard day,' said Ole, raising his son's hand to his mouth to breathe upon it. "'And look how he's used the oar. 
the bloods burst out at his fingertips. Ole laughed through his tears. He was a good lad. He was food to me, and light and heat, too. There never came an unkind word out of his mouth to me that was a burden on him. And now I've got no son, Fries. I'm childless now, and I'm not able to do anything. You shall have enough to live upon, Ole, said Fries. Without coming on the parish, I shouldn't like to come upon the parish. Yes, without coming on the parish, Ole. If only he can get peace now. He had so little peace in this world these last few years. There's been a song made out of his misfortune, Fries, and every time he heard it he was like a newborn lamb in the cold. The children sing it, too. Ole looked round at them imploringly. It was only a piece of boyish heedlessness, and now he's taken his punishment. Your son hasn't had any punishment, Ole, and neither has he deserved any, said Fries, putting his arm about the old man's shoulder. But he's given a great gift as he lies there and cannot say anything. He gave five men their lives, and gave up his own in return for the one offense that he committed in thoughtlessness. It was a generous son you had, Ole. Fries looked at him with a bright smile. Yes, said Ole, with animation. He saved five people. Of course he did. Yes, he did. He had not thought of that before. It would probably never have occurred to him. But now someone else had given it form, and he clung to it. He saved five lives, even if they were only Finn Laps, so perhaps God will not disown him. Free shook until his gray hair fell over his eyes. Never forget him, children, he said, and now go quietly home. The children silently took up their things and went. At that moment they would have done anything that Fries told them. He had complete power over them. Ole stood staring absently, and then took Fries by the sleeve and drew him up to the dead body. He's rowed well, he said. The blood's come out at his finger-ends, look. And he raised his son's hands to the light. And there's a wrist, Fries. He could take up an old man like me and carry me like a little child. Ole laughed feebly. But I carried him. All the way from the south reef I carried him on my back. I'm too heavy for you, father, I could hear him say, for he was a good son. But I carried him, and now I can't do anything more. If only they see that. He was looking again at the blood-stained fingers. He did do his best. If only God himself would give him his discharge. Yes, said Fries. God will give him his discharge himself. And he sees everything, you know, Ole. Some fishermen entered the room. They took off their caps and one by one went quietly up and shook hands with Ole. And then, each passing his hand over his face, turned questioningly to the schoolmaster. Fries nodded, and they raised the dead body between them and passed with heavy, cautious steps out through the entry and on toward the village, Ole following them, bowed down and moaning to himself. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of Pele the Conqueror, Volume One, by Martin Anderson Nexo, translated by Jesse Muir. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was Pele who, one day in his first year at school, when he was being questioned in religion, and Fries asked him whether he would give the names of the three greatest festivals in the year, amused everyone by answering. Midsummer Eve, Harvest Home, and, and... There was a third, too, but when it came to the point, he was shy of mentioning it, his birthday. In certain ways, it was the greatest of them all, even though no one but Father Lassa knew about it. And the people who wrote the almanac, of course, they knew about simply everything. It came on the 26th of June, and was called Pelagius in the calendar. In the morning his father kissed him and said, Happiness and a blessing to you, laddie. 
and then there was always something in his pocket when he came to pull on his trousers. His father was just as excited as he was himself, and waited by him while he dressed to share in the surprise. But it was Pelle's way to spin things out when something nice was coming. It made the pleasure all the greater. He purposely passed over the interesting pocket, while Father Lasse stood by fidgeting and not knowing what to do. "'I say, what's the matter with that pocket? It looks to me so fat. You surely haven't been out stealing hen's eggs in the night?' Then Pelle had to take it out, a large bundle of paper, and undo it, layer after layer. And Lasse would be amazed. "'Pooh! It's nothing but paper. What rubbish to go and fill your pockets with!' But in the very inside of all there was a pocket-knife with two blades. "'Thank you,' whispered Pelle then, with tears in his eyes. "'Oh, nonsense! It's a poor present, that,' said Lasse, blinking his red, lashless eyelids. Beyond this the boy did not come in for anything better on that day than usual. But all the same he had a solemn feeling all day. The sun never failed to shine, was even unusually bright, and the animals looked meaningly at him while they lay munching. "'It's my birthday today,' he said, hanging with his arms round the neck of Nero, one of the bullocks. "'Can you say a happy birthday?' And Nero breathed warm breath down his back, together with green juice from his chewing. And Pelle went about happy and stole green corn to give to him and to his favorite calf, kept the new knife, or whatever it might have been, in his hand the whole day long, and dwelt in a peculiarly solemn way on everything he did. He could make the whole of the long day swell with a festive feeling, and when he went to bed he tried to keep awake so as to make the day longer still. Nevertheless, Midsummer Eve was, in its way, a greater day. It had, at any rate, the glamour of the unattainable over it. On that day, everything that could creak and walk went up to the common. There was not a servant on the whole island so poor-spirited as to submit to the refusal of a holiday on that day, none except just Lasse and Pelle. Every year they had seen the day come and go without sharing in its pleasure. "'Someone must stay at home, confound it,' said the bailiff always. "'Or perhaps you think I can do it all for you.' They had all too little power to assert themselves. Lasse helped to pack appetizing food and beverages into the carts and see the others off, and then went about despondently, one man to do all the work. Pelle watched from the field their merry departure and the white stripe of dust far away behind the rocks. And for half a year afterward, at meals, they heard reminiscences of drinking and fighting and love-making, the whole festivity. But this was at an end. Lasse was not the man to continue to let himself be trifled with. He possessed a woman's affection and a house in the background. He could give notice any day he liked. The magistrate was presumably busy with the prescribed advertising for Madame Olson's husband, and as soon as the lawful respite was over, they would come together. Lasse no longer sought to avoid the risk of dismissal. As long ago as the winter, he had driven the bailiff into a corner, and only agreed to be taken on again, upon the express condition that they both took part in the Midsummer Eve outing and he had witnesses to it. On the common, where all lovers held tryst that day, Lasse and she were to meet too, but of this Pelle knew nothing. "'Today we can say the day after tomorrow, and tomorrow we can say tomorrow,' Pelle went about repeating to his father two evenings before the day. He had kept an account of the time ever since May Day, by making strokes for all the days on the inside lid of the chest and crossing them out one by one. "'Yes, and the day after tomorrow we shall say to-day,' said Lasse with a juvenile fling. They opened their eyes upon an incomprehensibly brilliant world, 
and did not at first remember that this was the day. Lasse had anticipated his wages to the amount of five kronas, and had got an old cottager to do his work, for half a krona and his meals. "'It's not a big wage,' said the man. "'But if I give you a hand, perhaps the Almighty'll give me one in return. "'Well, we've no one but him to hold to, we poor creatures,' answered Lasse. "'But I shall think of you in my grave.' The cottager arrived by four o'clock, and Lasse was able to begin his holiday from that hour. Whenever he was about to take a hand in the work, the other said, "'No, leave it alone. I'm sure you've not often had a holiday.' "'No, this is the first real holiday since I came to the farm,' said Lasse, drawing himself up with a lordly air. Pelle was in his best clothes from the first thing in the morning, and went about smiling in his shirt-sleeves and with his hair plastered down from water. His best cap and jacket were not to be put on until they were going to start. When the sun shone upon his face, it sparkled like dewy grass. There was nothing to trouble about. The animals were in the enclosure, and the bailiff was going to look after them himself. He kept near his father, who had brought this about. Father Lasse was powerful. "'What a good thing you threatened to leave!' he kept on exclaiming. And Lasse always gave the same answer. "'Aye, you must carry things with a high hand, if you want to gain anything in this world,' and nodded with a consciousness of power. They were to have started at eight o'clock, but the girls could not get the provisions ready in time. There were jars of stewed gooseberries, huge piles of pancakes, a hard-boiled egg apiece, cold veal, and an endless supply of bread and butter. The carriage boxes could not nearly hold it all, so large baskets were pushed in under the seats. In the front was a small cask of beer, covered with green oats to keep the sun from it, and there was a whole keg of spirits and three bottles of cold punch. Almost the entire bottom of the large spring wagon was covered, so that it was difficult to find room for one's feet. After all, Fru Kongstrup showed a proper feeling for her servants when she wanted to. She went about like a kind mistress, and saw that everything was well packed and that nothing was wanting. She was not like Kongstrup, who always had to have a bailiff between himself and them. She even joked and did her best, and it was evident that whatever else there might be to say against her, she wanted them to have a merry day. That her face was a little sad was not to be wondered at, as the farmer had driven out that morning with her young relative. At last the girls were ready, and every one got in, in high spirits. The men inadvertently sat upon the girls' laps and jumped up in alarm. "'Uh-oh! I must have gone too near a stove!' cried the rogue Mons rubbing himself behind. Even the mistress could not help laughing. "'Isn't Eric going with us?' asked his old sweetheart Bengta, who still had a warm spot in her heart for him. The bailiff whistled shrilly twice, and Eric came slowly up from the barn, where he had been standing and keeping watch upon his master. "'Won't you go with them to the woods today, Eric man?' asked the bailiff kindly. Eric stood twisting his big body and murmuring something that no one could understand, and then made an unwilling movement with one shoulder. "'You'd better go with them,' said the bailiff, pretending he was going to take him and put him into the cart. "'Then I shall have to see whether I can get over the loss.' Those in the cart laughed, but Eric shuffled off down through the yard, with his dog-like glance directed backward at the bailiff's feet and stationed himself at the corner of the stable, where he stood watching. He held his cap behind his back, as boys do when they play at robbers. "'He's a queer customer,' said Mons. Then Karl Johann guided the horses carefully through the gate, and they set off with a crack of the whip. Along all the roads, 
vehicles were making their way toward the highest part of the island, filled to overflowing with merry people who sat on one another's laps and hung right over the sides. The dust rose behind the conveyances and hung white in the air in stripes miles in length that showed how the roads lay like spokes in a wheel, all pointing toward the middle of the island. The air hummed with merry voices and the strains of concertinas. They missed Gustav's playing now, yes, and Bodil's pretty face, that always shone so brightly on a day like this. Pelle had the appetite of years of fasting for the great world, and devoured everything with his eyes. Look there, father, just look. Nothing escaped him. It made the others cheerful to look at him. He was so rosy and pretty. He wore a newly washed blue blouse under his waistcoat, which showed at the neck and wrists and did duty as collar and cuffs. But fair Maria bent back from the box seat, where she was sitting alone with Karl Johann, and tied a very white scarf round his neck. And Karna, who wanted to be motherly to him, went over his face with a corner of her pocket handkerchief, which she moistened with her tongue. She was rather officious, but for that matter, it was quite conceivable that the boy might have got dirty again since his thorough morning wash. The side roads continued to pour their contents out onto the high roads, and there was soon a whole river of conveyances, extending as far as the eye could see in both directions. One would hardly have believed that there were so many vehicles in the whole world. Karl Johann was a good driver to have. He was always pointing with his whip and telling them something. He knew all about every single house. They were beyond the farms and tillage by now, but on the heath, where self-sown birch and aspen trees stood fluttering restlessly in the summer air, there stood desolate new houses with bare plastered walls and not much as a henbane in the window or a bit of curtain. The fields round them were as stony as a newly mended road, and the crops were a sad sight. The corn was only two or three inches in height, and already in ear. The people here were all Swedish servants who had saved a little, and had now become landowners. Karl Johan knew a good many of them. "'It looks very miserable,' said Lasse, comparing in his own mind the stones here with Madame Olsen's fat land. Oh, well, answered the head man. It's not of the very best, of course, but the land yields something anyhow. And he pointed to the fine large heaps of road metal and hewn stone that surrounded every cottage. If it isn't exactly grain, it gives something to live on, and then it's the only land that'll suit poor people's purses. He and Fair Maria were thinking of settling down here themselves. Kongstrup had promised to help them to a farm with two horses when they married. In the wood, the birds were in the middle of their morning song. They were later with it here than in the sandbanks plantation, it seemed. The air sparkled brightly, and something invisible seemed to rise from the undergrowth. It was like being in a church, with the sun shining down through tall windows and the organ playing. They drove round the foot of a steep cliff with overhanging trees and into the wood. It was almost impossible to thread your way through the crowd of unharnessed horses and vehicles. You had to have all your wits about you to keep from damaging your own or other people's things. Karl Johann sat watching both his four wheels and felt his way on step by step. He was like a cat in a thunderstorm. He was so wary. Hold your jaw, he said sharply, when any one in the cart opened his lips. At last they found room to unharness, and a rope was tied from tree to tree to form a square in which the horses were secured. Then they got out the curry combs. Goodness, how dusty it had been. And at last, well, no one said anything, but they all stood expectant, half turned in the direction of the head man. Well, I suppose we ought to go into the wood and look at the view, he said. They turned it over as they wandered aimlessly round the cart, looking furtively at the provisions. If only it'll keep, said Anders, lifting a basket. 
I don't know how it is, but I feel so strange in my inside today, Mons began. It can't be consumption, can it? Perhaps we ought to taste the good things first, then, said Karl Johan. Yes, oh yes, it came at last. Last year they had eaten their dinner on the grass. It was Bodil who had thought of that. She was always a little fantastic. This year no one would be the one to make such a suggestion. They looked at one another a little expectant, and they then climbed up into the cart and settled themselves there just like other decent people. After all, the food was the same. The pancakes were as large and thick as a saucepan lid. It reminded them of Eric, who last year had eaten ten of them. It's a pity he's not here this year, said Karl Johan. He was a merry devil. He's not badly off, said Mons. Gets his food and clothes given him, and does nothing but follow at the bailiff's heels and copy him. And he's always contented now. I wouldn't a bit mind changing with him. And run around like a dog with its nose to the ground, sniffing at its master's footsteps. Oh no, not I. Whatever you may say, you must remember that it's the Almighty himself who's taken his wits into safe keeping," said Lasse admonishingly, and for a little while they were quite serious at the thought. But seriousness could not claim more than was its due. Anders wanted to rub his leg, but made a mistake and caught hold of lively Sarah's and made her scream. And this so flustered his hand that it could not find its way up, but went on making mistakes and there was much laughter and merriment. Karl Johan was not taking much part in the hilarity. He looked as if he were pondering something. Suddenly he roused himself and drew out his purse. Here goes, he said stoutly. I'll stand beer, Bavarian beer, of course. Who'll go and fetch it? Mons leaped quickly from the cart. How many? Four. Karl Johann's eye ran calculating over the cart. No, just bring five, will you? That'll be a half each, he said easily. But make sure that it's real Bavarian beer they give you. There was really no end to the things that Karl Johann knew about, and he said the name Bavarian beer with no more difficulty than others would have in turning a quid in their mouth. But of course he was a trusted man on the farm now, and often drove on errands into the town. This raised their spirits and awakened curiosity, for most of them had never tasted Bavarian beer before. Lasse and Pelle openly admitted their inexperience, but Anders pretended he had got drunk on it more than once, though everyone knew it was untrue. Mons returned, moving cautiously, with the beer in his arms. It was a precious commodity. They drank it out of the large dram glasses that were meant for the punch. In the town, of course, they drank beer out of huge mugs, but Karl Johann considered that that was simply swilling. The girls refused to drink, but did it after all, and were delighted. They're always like that, said Mons, when you offer them something really good. They became flushed with the excitement of the occurrence and thought they were drunk. Lasse took away the taste of his beer with a dram. He did not like it at all. "'I'm too old,' he said, in excuse. The provisions were packed up again, and they set out in a body to see the view. They had to make their way through a perfect forest of carts to reach the pavilion. Horses were neighing and flinging up their hind legs, so that the bark flew off the trees. Men hurled themselves in among them, and tugged at their mouths until they quieted down again, while the women screamed and ran hither and thither like frightened hens with skirts lifted. From the top they could form some idea of the number of people. On the sides of the hill and in the woods beyond the roads, everywhere carts covered the ground, and down at the triangle where the two wide high roads met, new loads were continually turning in. There must be far more than a thousand pairs of horses in the wood today, said Karl Johan. Yes, 
far more. There were a million, if not more, thought Pelle. He was quite determined to get as much as possible out of everything today. There stood the bridge farm cart, and there came the people from Hammersholm, right out at the extreme north of the island. Here were numbers of people from the shore farms at Dove Point and Rana and Nexo. The whole island was there. But there was no time now to fall in with acquaintances. We shall meet this afternoon, was the general cry. Karl Johann led the expedition. It was one of a headman's duties to know the way about the common. Fair Maria kept faithfully by his side, and every one could see how proud she was of him. Mons walked hand in hand with lively Sarah, and they went swinging along like a couple of happy children. Bengta and Anders were having some difficulty in agreeing. They quarreled every other minute, but they did not mean much by it, and Karna made herself agreeable. They descended into a swamp and went up again by a steep ascent where the great trees stood with their feet in one another's necks. Pelle leaped about everywhere like a young kid. In under the firs there were ant hills as big as haycocks, and the ants had broad trodden paths running like footpaths between the trees, on and on endlessly. A multitude of hosts passed backward and forward upon those roads. Under some small fir trees, a hedgehog was busy attacking a wasp's nest. It poked its nose into the nest, drew it quickly back, and sneezed. It looked wonderfully funny, but Pelle had to go on after the others. And soon he was far ahead of them, lying on his face in a ditch where he had smelt wild strawberries. Lasse could not keep pace with the younger people up the hill, and it was not much better with Karna. We're getting old, we two, she said, as they toiled up, panting. Oh, are we, was Lasse's answer. He felt quite young in spirit. It was only breath that he was short of. I expect you think very much as I do. When you've worked for others for so many years, you feel you want something of your own. Yes, perhaps, said Lasse evasively. One wouldn't come to it quite empty-handed, either, if it should happen. Oh, indeed! Karna continued in this way, but Lasse was always sparing with his words, until they arrived at the rocking stone, where the others were standing waiting. That was a block and a half, fifty tons it was said to weigh, and yet Mons and Anders could rock it by putting a stick under one end of it. And now we ought to go to the robber's castle, said Karl Johann, as they trudged on, always up and down. Lasse did his utmost to keep beside the others, for he did not feel very brave when he was alone with Karna. What a fearful quantity of trees there were, and not all of one sort, as in other parts of the world. There were birches and firs, beech and larch and mountain ash all mixed together, and ever so many cherry trees. The head man led them across a little dark lake that lay at the foot of the rock, staring up like an evil eye. It was here that little Anna drowned her baby, she that was betrayed by her master, he said lingeringly. They all knew the story and stood silent over the lake, the girls had tears in their eyes. As they stood there silent, thinking of little Anna's sad fate, an unspeakably soft note came up to them, followed by a long, affecting sobbing. They moved nearer to one another. "'Oh, Lord!' whispered Fair Maria, shivering. "'That's the baby's soul crying!' Pelle stiffened as he listened, and cold waves seemed to flow down his back. Why, that's a nightingale, said Karl Johann. Don't you even know that? There are hundreds of them in these woods, and they sing in the middle of the day. This was a relief to the older people, but Pelle's horror was not so easily thrown off. He had gazed into the depths of the other world, and every explanation glanced off him. 
But then came the robber's castle as a great disappointment. He had imagined it peopled with robbers, but it was only some old ruins that stood on a little hill in the middle of a bog. He went by himself all around the bottom of it to see if there were not some secret underground passage that led down to the water. If there were, he would get hold of his father without letting the others know, and make his way in and look for the chests of money, or else there would be too many to share in it. But this was forgotten, as a peculiar scent arrested his attention, and he came upon a piece of ground that was green with lily-of-the-valley plants that still bore a few flowers, and where there were wild strawberries. There were so many that he had to go and call the others. But this was also forgotten as he made his way through the underwood to get up. He had lost the path and gone astray in the damp, chilly darkness under the cliff. Creeping plants and thorns wove themselves in among the overhanging branches and made a thick, low roof. He could not see an opening anywhere, and a strange green light came through the matted branches. The ground was slippery with moisture and decaying substances. From the cliff hung quivering fern fronds, with their points downward, and water dripping from them like wet hair. Huge tree roots, like the naked bodies of black goblins writhing to get free, lay stretched across the rocks. A little further on, the sun made a patch of burning fire in the darkness, and beyond it rose a bluish vapor and a sound as of a distant threshing machine. Pelle stood still, and his terror grew until his knees trembled. Then he set off running as if he were possessed. A thousand shadow hands stretched out after him as he ran, and he pushed his way through briars and creepers with a low cry. The daylight met him with the force of a blow, and something behind him had a firm grasp on his clothes. He had to shout for Father Lasse with all his might before it let go. And then he stood right out in the bog, while high above his head the others sat, upon a point of rock all among the trees. From up there it looked as if the world were all treetops, rising and falling endlessly. There was foliage far down beneath your feet, and out as far as the eye could see, up and down. You were almost tempted to throw yourself into it. It looked so invitingly soft. As a warning to the others, Karl Johann had to tell them about the tailor's apprentice, who jumped out from a projecting rock here, just because the foliage looked so temptingly soft. Strange to say, he escaped with his life, but the high tree he fell through stripped him of every stitch of clothing. Mons had been teasing Sarah by saying that he was going to jump down, but now he drew back cautiously. I don't want to risk my confirmation clothes, he said, trying to look good. After all, the most remarkable thing of all was the Horseman Hill with the royal monument. The tower alone. Not a bit of wood had been used in it, only granite, and you went round and round and round. You're counting the steps, I suppose, said Karl Johann admonishingly. Oh, yes, they were all counting to themselves. It was clear weather, and the island spread out beneath them in all its luxuriance. The very first thing the men wanted to do was to try what it was like to spit down, but the girls were giddy and kept themselves in a cluster in the middle of the platform. The churches were counted under Karl Johann's able guidance, and all the well-known places pointed out. There's Stone Farm, too, said Anders, pointing to something far off toward the sea. It was not Stone Farm, but Karl Johann could say to a nicety, behind which hill it ought to lie, and then they recognized the quarries. Lasse took no part in this. He stood quite still, gazing at the blue line of the Swedish coast that stood out far away upon the shining water. The sight of his native land made him feel weak and old. He would probably never go home again, although he would have dearly liked to see Bengta's grave once more. 
Ah, yes, and the best that could happen to one would be to be allowed to rest by her side when everything else was ended. At this moment he regretted that he had gone into exile in his old age. He wondered what Kungstorp looked like now, whether the new people kept the land cultivated at all, and all the old acquaintances, how were they getting on? His old man's reminiscences came over him so strongly that for a time he forgot Madame Olsen and everything about her. He allowed himself to be lulled by past memories and wept in his heart like a little child. Ah, it was dreary to live away from one's native place and everything in one's old age. But if it only brought a blessing upon the laddie in some way or other, it was all as it should be. I suppose that's the King's Copenhagen we see over there, asked Anders. It's Sweden, said Lasse quietly. Sweden, is it? But it lay on that side last year, if I remember rightly. Yes, of course. What else should the world go round for? exclaimed Mons. Anders was just about to take this in all good faith, when he caught a grimace that Mons made to the others. Oh, you clever monkey! he cried, and sprang at Mons, who dashed down the stone stairs, and the sound of their footsteps came up in a hollow rumble as out of a huge cask. The girls stood leaning against one another, rocking gently, and gazing silently at the shining water that lay far away round the island. The giddiness had made them languid. "'What? Why, your eyes are quite dreamy,' said Karl Johann trying to take them all into his embrace. Aren't you coming down with us? They were all fairly tired now. No one said anything, for of course Karl Johann was leading. But the girl showed an inclination to sit down. Now there's only the Echo Valley left, he said encouragingly. And that's on our way back. We must do that, for it's well worth it. You'll hear an echo there that hasn't its equal anywhere. They went slowly, for their feet were tender with the leather boots and much aimless walking. But when they had come down the steep cliff into the valley and had drunk from the spring, they brightened up. Karl Johann stationed himself with legs astride and called across to the cliff. What's Karl Johann's greatest treat? And the echo answered straight away, Eat! It was exceedingly funny, and they all had to try it each with his or her name, even Pelle. When that was exhausted, Mons made up a question which made the echo give a rude answer. "'You mustn't teach it anything like that,' said Lasse. "'Just suppose some fine ladies were to come here, and he started calling that out after them. They almost killed themselves with laughing at the old man's joke, and he was so delighted at the applause that he went on repeating it to himself on the way back. "'Ha, ha!' He wasn't quite fit for the scrap heap yet. When they got back to the cart, they were ravenously hungry and settled down to another meal. You must have something to keep you up when you're wandering about like this, said Mons. Now then, said Karl Johann, when they had finished, everyone may do what they like, but at nine sharp we meet here again and drive home. Up on the open ground, Lasse gave Pelle a secret nudge and they began to do business with a cake seller until the others had got well ahead. "'It's not nice being third wheel in a carriage,' said Lasse. "'We two'll go about by ourselves for a little now.' Lasse was craning his neck. "'Are you looking for anyone?' asked Pelle. "'No, no one in particular. But I was wondering where all these people come from. There are many people from all over the country, but I haven't seen anyone from the village yet.' Don't you think Madame Olsen will be here today? Can't say, said Lasse. But it would be nice to see her, and there's something I want to say to her, too. Your eyes are young. You must keep a lookout. Pelle was given fifty ora to spend on whatever he liked. Round the ground sat the poor women of the heath at little stalls, from which they sold colored sugar sticks, gingerbread, and two ora cigars. In the meantime, he went from woman to woman, and bought of each for one or two ora. Away under the trees stood blind Hoyer, 
who had come straight from Copenhagen with new ballads. There was a crowd round him. He played the tune upon his concertina, his little withered wife sang to it, and the whole crowd sang carefully with her. Those who had learnt the tunes went away singing, and others pushed forward into their place and put down their five or apiece. Lasse and Pelle stood on the edge of the crowd listening. There was no use in paying money before you knew what you would get for it, and anyhow the songs would be all over the island by tomorrow, and going gratis from mouth to mouth. A man of eighty, a new and pleasant ballad about how things go, when a decrepit old man takes a young wife, shouted Hoyer in a hoarse voice before the song began. Lasse didn't care very much about that ballad, but then came a terribly sad one about the sailor George Simmon, who took a most tender farewell of his sweetheart, and said, When here I once more stand, we to the church will go hand in hand. But he never did come back, for the storm was over them for forty-five days, provisions ran short, and the girl's lover went mad. He drew his knife upon the captain and demanded to be taken home to his bride, but the captain shot him down. Then the others threw themselves upon the corpse, carried it to the galley, and made soup of it. The girl still waits for her own true love. Away from the shore she will not move. Poor maid, she's hoping she still may wed, and does not know that her lad is dead. That's beautiful, said Lasse, rummaging in his purse for a five ora. You must try to learn that. You've got an ear for that sort of thing. They pushed through the crowd right up to the musician, and began cautiously to sing too, while the girls all round were sniffing. They wandered up and down among the trees, Lasse rather fidgety. There was a whole street of dancing booths, tents with conjurers and panorama men, and drinking booths. The criers were perspiring, the refreshment sellers were walking up and down in front of their tents like greedy beasts of prey. They had not got into full swing yet, for most of the people were still out and about seeing the sights, or amusing themselves in all seemliness, exerting themselves in trials of strength, or slipping in and out of the conjurer's tents. There was not a man unaccompanied by a woman. Many a one came to a stand at the refreshment tents, but the woman pulled him past. Then he would yawn and allow himself to be dragged up into a roundabout or a magic lantern tent, where the most beautiful pictures were shown of the way that cancer and other horrible things made havoc in people's insides. "'These are just the things for the women,' said Lasse, breathing forth a sigh at haphazard after Madame Olsen. On a horse on Madvig's roundabout sat Gustav with his arm round Bodil's waist. "'Hey, old man!' he cried as they whizzed past and flapped Lasse on the ear with his cap, which had the white side out. They were as radiant as the day and the sun, those two. Pelle wanted to have a turn on a roundabout. "'Then blessed if I won't have something too that'll make things go round,' said Lasse, and went in and had a cuckoo, coffee with brandy in it. "'There are some people,' he said, when he came out again, "'that can go from one tavern to another.' without its making any difference in their purse. It would be very nice to try, only for a year. Hush! Over by Max Alexander's green house stood Karna, quite alone and looking about her wistfully. Lasse drew Pelle round in a wide circle. "'There's Madame Olsen with a strange man,' said Pelle suddenly. Lasse started. "'Where?' "'Yes, there she stood, and had a man with her.' and talking so busily. They went past her without stopping. She could choose for herself then. "'Hi, can't you wait a little?' cried Madame Olsen, running after them so that her petticoats crackled round her. She was round and smiling as usual, and many layers of good home-woven material stood out about her. There was no scrimping anywhere. They went on together, talking on indifferent matters and now and then exchanging glances about the boy who was in their way. 
they had to walk so sedately without venturing to touch one another. He did not like any nonsense. It was black with people now up at the pavilion, and one could hardly move a step without meeting acquaintances. "'It's even worse than a swarm of bees,' said Lasse. "'It's not worth trying to get in there.' At one place the movement was outward, and by following it they found themselves in a valley where a man stood shouting and beating his fists upon a platform. It was a missionary meeting. The audience lay encamped in small groups up the slopes, and a man in long black clothes went quietly from group to group, selling leaflets. His face was white, and he had a very long, thin red beard. "'Do you see that man?' whispered Lasse, giving Pelle a nudge. "'Upon my word, if it isn't Long Ole, and with a glove on his injured hand. It was him that had to take the sin upon him for Per Olsen's false swearing, explained Lasse, turning to Madame Olsen. He was standing at the machine at the time when Per Olsen ought to have paid the penalty with his three fingers, and so his went instead. He may be glad of the mistake after all, for they say he's risen to great things among the prayer-meeting folks, and his complexion's as fine as a young lady's something different to what it was when he was carting manure at Stone Farm. It'll be fun to say good day to him again. Lasse was quite proud of having served together with this man, and stationed himself in front of the others, intending to make an impression upon his lady friend by saying a hearty, Good day, Ole. Long Ole was at the next group, and now he came on to them and was going to hold out his tracks, when a glance at Lasse made him drop both hand and eyes, and with a deep sigh he passed on with bowed head to the next group. "'Did you see how he turned his eyes up?' said Lasse derisively. "'When beggars come to court, they don't know how to behave. He'd got a watch in his pocket, too, and long clothes, and before he hadn't even a shirt to his body. And an ungodly devil he was, too.' But the old gentleman looks after his own, as the saying is. I expect it's him that helped him on by changing places at the machine. The way they've cheated the Almighty's enough to make him weep. Madame Olsen tried to hush Lasse, but the cuckoo rose within him, together with his wrath, and he continued, So he's above recognizing decent people who get what they have in an honorable way, and not by lying and humbug. They do say he makes love to all the farmers' wives wherever he goes, but there was a time when he had to put up with the sow. People began to look at them, and Madame Olsen took Lasse firmly by the arm and drew him away. The sun was now low in the sky. Up on the open ground the crowds tramped round and round, as if in a treadmill. Now and then a drunken man reeled along, making a broad path for himself through the crush. The noise came seething up from the tents, barrel organs each grinding out a different tune, criers, the bands of the various dancing booths, and the measured tread of a shatish or polka. The women wandered up and down in clusters, casting long looks into the refreshment tents where their men were sitting, and some of them stopped at the tent door and made coaxing signs to someone inside. Under the tree stood a drunken man pawing at a tree trunk, and beside him stood a girl, crying with her black damask apron to her eyes. Pelle watched them for a long time. The man's clothes were disordered, and he lurched against the girl with a foolish grin while she, in the midst of her tears, tried to put them straight. When Pelle turned away, Lasse and Madame Olsen had disappeared in the crowd. They must have gone on a little and he went down to the very end of the street. Then he turned despondingly and went up, burrowing this way and that in the stream of people with eyes everywhere. "'Haven't you seen Father Lasse?' he asked pitifully, when he met anyone he knew. In the thickest of the crush a tall man was moving along, holding forth blissfully at the top of his voice. He was a head taller than anyone else, and very broad but he beamed with good nature and wanted to embrace everybody. People ran screaming out of his way so that a broad path was left wherever he went. 
Pelle kept behind him, and thus succeeded in getting through the thickest crowds, where policemen and rangers were stationed with thick cudgels. Their eyes and ears were on the watch, but they did not interfere in anything. It was said that they had handcuffs in their pockets. Pelle had reached the road in his despairing search. Cart after cart was carefully working its way out through the gloom under the trees, then rolling out into the dazzling evening light and on to the high road with much cracking of whips. They were the prayer-meeting people driving home. He happened to think of the time and asked a man what it was. Nine. Pelle had to run so as not to be too late in getting to the cart. In the cart sat Karl Johan and Fair Maria eating. "'Get up and have something to eat,' they said, and as Pelle was ravenous he forgot everything while he ate. But then Johan asked about Lasse, and his torment returned. Karl Johan was cross. Not one had returned to the cart, although it was the time agreed upon. "'You'd better keep close to us now,' he said, as they went up, or you might get killed. Up at the edge of the wood they met Gustav running. "'Have none of you seen Bodil?' he asked, gasping. His clothes were torn, and there was blood on the front of his shirt. He ran on groaning and disappeared under the trees. It was quite dark there, but the open ground lay in a strange light that came from nowhere but seemed to have been left behind by the day as it fled. Faces out there showed up, some in ghostly pallor, some black like holes in the light, and they suddenly burst forth, crimson with blood-red flame. The people wandered about in confused groups, shouting and screaming at the top of their voices. Two men came along, with arms twined affectionately round one another's necks and the next moment lay rolling on the ground in a fight. Others joined the fray and took sides without troubling to discover what it was all about, and the contest became one large struggling heap. Then the police came up and hit about them with their sticks, and those who did not run away were handcuffed and thrown into an empty stable. Pelle was quite upset and kept close to Karl Johan. He jumped every time a band approached, and kept on saying, in a whimpering tone, "'Where's Father Lasse? Let's go and find him.' "'Oh, hold your tongue!' exclaimed the head man, who was standing and trying to catch sight of his fellow servants. He was angry at this untrustworthiness. "'Don't stand there crying. You'd do much more good if you ran down to the cart and see whether anyone's come.' Pelle had to go, little though he cared to venture in under the trees. The branches hung silently, listening. But the noise from the open ground came down in bursts, and in the darkness under the bushes living things rustled about and spoke in voices of joy or sorrow. A sudden scream rang through the wood and made his knees knock together. Karna sat on the back of the cart asleep, and Bengta stood leaning against the front seat, weeping. "'They've locked Anders up,' she sobbed. He got wild, so they put handcuffs on him and locked him up. She went back with Pelle. Lasse was with Karl Johan and Fair Maria. He looked defiantly at Pelle, and in his half-closed eyes there was a little mutinous gleam. Then now there's only Mons and lively Sarah, said Karl Johan, as he ran his eye over them. But what about Anders? sobbed Bengta. You surely won't drive away without Anders? "'There's nothing can be done about Anders,' said the head man. "'He'll come of his own accord when once he's let out.' They found out, on inquiry, that Mons and lively Sarah were down in one of the dancing booths, and accordingly went down there. "'Now you stay here,' said Karl Johann sternly, and went in to take a survey of the dancers. In there blood burnt hot, and faces were like balls of fire that made red circles in the blue mist of perspiring heat and dust. Dump, dump, dump. The measure fell booming like heavy blows, and in the middle of the floor stood a man and wrung the moisture out of his jacket. Out of one of the dancing tents pushed a big fellow with two girls. 
He had an arm about the neck of each, and they linked arms behind his back. His cap was on the back of his head, and his riotous mood would have found expression in leaping if he had not felt himself too pleasantly encumbered. So he opened his mouth wide and shouted joyfully, so that it rang again, Devil take me! Deuce take me! Seven hundred devils take me! and disappeared under the trees with his girls. That was Per Olsen himself, said Lasse, looking after him. What a man, to be sure! He certainly doesn't look as if he bore any debt of sin to the Almighty. His time may still come, was the opinion of Karl Johan. Quite by chance they found Mons and lively Sarah sitting asleep in one another's arms upon a bench under the trees. "'Well, now, I suppose we ought to be getting home,' said Karl Johann slowly. He had been doing right for so long that his throat was quite dry. "'I suppose none of you'll stand a farewell glass.' "'I will,' said Mons, "'if you'll go up to the pavilion with me to drink it.' Mons had missed something by going to sleep, and had a desire to go once round the ground. Every time a yell reached them, he gave a leap as he walked beside lively Sarah, and answered with a long halloo. He tried to get away, but she clung to his arm, so he swung the heavy end of his loaded stick and shouted defiantly. Lasse kicked his old limbs and imitated Mons's shouts, for he too was for anything rather than going home. But Karl Johann was determined. They were to go now and in this he was supported by Pelle and the women. Out on the open ground a roar made them stop, and the women got each behind her man. A man came running bareheaded and with a large wound in his temple, from which the blood flowed down over his face and collar. His features were distorted with fear. Behind him came a second, also bareheaded, and with a drawn knife. A ranger tried to bar his way, but received a wound in his shoulder and fell, and the pursuer ran on. As he passed them, Mons uttered a short yell and sprang straight up into the air, bringing down his loaded stick upon the back of the man's neck. The man sank to the ground with a grunt, and Mons slipped in among the groups of people and disappeared, and the others found him waiting for them at the edge of the wood. He did not answer any more yells. Karl Johann had to lead the horses until they got out onto the road, and then they all got in. Behind them the noise had become lost, and only one long cry for help rang through the air and dropped again. Down by a little lake some forgotten girls had gathered on the grass and were playing by themselves. The white mist lay over the grass like a shining lake, and only the upper part of the girls' bodies rose above it. They were walking round in a ring, singing the Midsummer Night Song. Pure and clear rose the merry song, and yet was so strangely sad to listen to, because they who sang it had been left in the lurch by sots and brawlers. We will dance upon hill and meadow, we will wear out our shoes and stockings. Hey ho, my little sweetheart fair, we shall dance till the sun has risen high. Hey ho, my queen! Now we have danced upon the green. The tones fell so gently upon the ear and mind that memories and thoughts were purified of all that had been hideous, and the day itself could appear in its true colors as a joyful festival. For Lasse and Pelle, indeed, it had been a peerless day, making up for many years of neglect. The only pity was that it was over instead of about to begin. The occupants of the cart were tired now, some nodding and all silent. Lasse sat working about in his pocket with one hand. He was trying to obtain an estimate of the money that remained. It was expensive to keep a sweetheart when you did not want to be outdone by younger men in any way. Pelle was asleep and was slipping farther and farther down until Bengta took his head onto her lap. She herself was weeping bitterly about Anders. The daylight was growing rapidly brighter as they drove in to Stone Farm. End of chapter 18
Chapter 19 of Pele the Conqueror, Volume 1, by Martin Anderson Nexo, translated by Jesse Muir. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The master and mistress of Stone Farm were almost always the subject of common talk, and were never quite out of the thoughts of the people. There was as much thought and said about Kongstrup and his wife as about all the rest of the parish put together. They were bred to so many, their providence both in evil and good, that nothing that they did could be immaterial. No one ever thought of weighing them by the same standards as they used for others. They were something apart, beings who were endowed with great possessions, and could do and be as they liked, disregarding all considerations and entertaining all passions. All that came from Stone Farm was too great for ordinary mortals to sit in judgment upon. It was difficult enough to explain what went on, even when at such close quarters with it all as were Lhasa and Pele. To them, as to the others, the Stone Farm people were beings apart, who lived their life under greater conditions, beings, as it were, halfway between the human and the supernatural. In a world where such things as unquenchable passion and frenzied love wrought havoc. What happened, therefore, at Stone Farm supplied more excitement than the other events of the parish. People listened with open-mouthed interest to the smallest utterance from the big house, and when the outbursts came, trembled and went about oppressed and uncomfortable. No matter how clearly Lhasa, in the calm periods, might think he saw it all, the life up there would suddenly be dragged out of its ordinary recognized form again, and wrap itself around his and the boy's world like a misty sphere in which capricious powers warred just above their heads. It was now Jomfru Kohler's second year at the farm, in spite of all evil prophecies, and indeed things had turned out in such a way that every one had to own that his prognostications had been wrong. She was always fonder of driving with Kongstrup to the town than of staying at home to cheer Fru Kongstrup up in her loneliness. But such is youth. She behaved properly enough otherwise, and it was well known that Kongstrup had returned to his old hotel sweethearting in the town. Fru Kongstrup herself, moreover, showed no distrust of her young relative if she had ever felt any. She was as kind to her as if she had been her own daughter, and very often it was she herself who got Jomfru Kohler to go in the carriage to look after her husband. Otherwise the days passed as usual, and Fru Kongstrup was continually giving herself up to little drinking bouts and to grief. At such times she would weep over her wasted life and if he were at home would follow him with her accusations from room to room, until he would order the carriage and take flight, even in the middle of the night. The walls were so saturated with her voice that it penetrated through everything like a sorrowful, dull droning. Those who happened to be up at night, to look after animals or the like, could hear her talking incessantly up there, even if she were alone. But then Jomfru Kohler began to talk of going away. She suddenly got the idea that she wanted to go to Copenhagen and learn something, so that she could earn her own living. It sounded strange, as there was every prospect, of her some day inheriting the farmer's property. Fru Kongstrup was quite upset at the thought of losing her, and altogether forgot her other troubles in continually talking to her about it. Even when everything was settled, and they were standing in the mangling room with the maids, getting Jomfru Kohler's things ready for her journey, she still kept on, to no earthly purpose. Like all the Stone Farm family, she could never let go anything she had once got hold of. There was something strange about Jomfru Kohler's obstinacy of purpose. She was not even quite sure what she was going to do over there. I suppose she's going over to learn cooking said one and another with a covert smile. Fru Kongstrup herself had no suspicion. She, who was always suspecting something, seemed to be blind here. It must have been because she had such complete trust in Jomfru Kohler, and thought so much of her. 
she had not even time to sigh, so busy was she in putting everything into good order. Much need there was for it, too. Jomfru Kohler must have had her head full of very different things, judging from the condition her clothes were in. "'I'm glad Kongstrup's going over with her,' said Fru Kongstrup to Fair Maria one evening when they were sitting round the big darning basket, mending the young lady's stockings after the wash. They say Copenhagen's a bad town for inexperienced young people to come to, but Sino will get on all right, for she's got the good stock of the Kohlers in her. She said it all with such childish simplicity. You could tramp in and out of her heart with great wooden shoes on, suspicious though she was. Perhaps we'll come over and see you at Christmas, Sina, she added in the goodness of her heart. Jomfru Kohler opened her mouth and caught her breath in terror, but did not answer. She bent over her work and did not look at anyone all the evening. She never looked frankly at anyone now. She's ashamed of her deceitfulness, they said. The judgment would fall upon her. She ought to have known what she was doing, and not gone between the bark and the wood, especially here, where one of them trusted her entirely. In the upper yard, the new man, Pear, was busy getting the closed carriage ready. Eric stood beside him, idle. He looked unhappy and troubled, poor fellow, as he always did when he was not near the bailiff. Each time a wheel had to come off or be put on, he had to put his giant's back under the big carriage and lift it. Every now and then Lasse came to the stable door to get an idea of what was going on. Pelle was at school, it being the first day of the new half-year. She was going away today, the false wretch, who had let herself be drawn into deceiving one who had been a mother to her. Fru Kongstrup must be going with them down to the steamer, as the closed carriage was going. Lasse went into the bedroom to arrange one or two things, so that he could slip out in the evening without Pelle noticing it. He had given Pelle a little paper of sweets for Madame Olsen, and on the paper had drawn a cross with a lead button, and the cross meant, in all secrecy, that he could come to her that evening. While he took out his best clothes, and hid them under some hay close to the outer door, he hummed, Love's longing so strong, it helped me along, and the way was made short with the nightingale's song. He was looking forward so immensely to the evening. He had not been alone with her now for nearly a quarter of a year. He was proud, moreover, of having taken writing into his service, and that a writing that Pelle, quick reader of writing though he was, would not be able to make out. While the others were taking their after-dinner nap, Lasse went out and tidied up the dung heap. The carriage was standing up there, with one large trunk strapped on behind, and another standing on one edge of the box. Lasse wondered what such a girl would do when she was alone out in the wide world and had to pay the price of her sin. He supposed there must be places where they took in such girls in return for good payment. Everything could be got over there. Johanna Peel came waddling in at the gate up there. Lasse started when he saw her. She never came for any good. When she boldly exhibited herself here, she was always drunk, and then she stopped at nothing. It was sad to see how low misfortune could drag a woman. Lasse could not help thinking what a pretty girl she had been in her youth, and now all she thought of was making money out of her shame. He cautiously withdrew into the stable, so as not to be an eyewitness to anything, and peered out from there. The sow went up and down in front of the windows, and called in a thick voice, over which she had not full command. Kongstrup! Kongstrup! Come out and let me speak to you! You must let me have some money, for your son and I haven't had any food for three days. That's a wicked lie, said Lasse to himself indignantly, for she has a good income, but she wastes God's gifts, and now she's out to do some evil. He would have liked to take the fork and chase her out through the gate, but it was not well to expose oneself to her venomous tongue. She had her foot upon the step, but did not dare to mount. Fuddled though she was, 
there was something that kept her in check. She stood there groping at the handrail and mumbling to herself, and every now and then lifting her fat face and calling Kongstrup. Yomfru Kohler came inadvertently up from the basement and went toward the steps. Her eyes were on the ground, and she did not see the sow until it was too late, and then she turned quickly. Johanna Peel stood grinning. "'Come here, miss, and let me wish you good day,' she cried. "'You're too grand, are you? But the one may be just as good as the other. Perhaps it's because you can drive away in a carriage and have yours on the other side of the sea, while I had mine in a beet-field. But is that anything to be proud of? I say, just go up and tell my fine gentleman that his eldest's starving. I daren't go myself because of the evil eye. Long before this, Jomfru Kohler was down in the basement again. But Johanna Peel continued to stand and say the same thing over and over again, until the bailiff came dashing out toward her, when she retired, scolding, from the yard. The men had been aroused before their time by her screaming, and stood drowsily watching behind the barn doors. Lasse kept excited watch from the stable, and the girls had collected in the wash-house. What would happen now? They all expected some terrible outbreak. But nothing happened. Now, when Fru Kongstrup had the right to shake heaven and earth, so faithlessly had they treated her, now she was silent. The farm was as peaceful as on the days when they had come to a sort of understanding, and Kongstrup kept himself quiet. Fru Kongstrup passed the windows up there, and looked just like anybody else. Nothing happened. Something must have been said, however, for the young lady had a very tear-stained face when they got into the carriage, and Kongstrup wore his confused air. Then Karl Johann drove away with the two, and the mistress did not appear. She was probably ashamed for what concerned the others. Nothing had happened to relieve the suspense. It oppressed everyone. She must have accepted her unhappy lot, and given up standing out for her rights, now, just when everyone would have supported her. This tranquility was so unnatural, so unreasonable, that it made one melancholy and low-spirited. It was as though others were suffering on her behalf, and she herself had no heart. But then it broke down, and the sound of weeping began to ooze out over the farm, quiet and regular, like flowing heart's blood. All the evening it flowed. The weeping had never sounded so despairing. It went to the hearts of all. She had taken in the poor child and treated her as her own, and the poor child had deceived her. Every one felt how she must suffer. During the night the weeping rose to cries so heart-rending that they awakened even Pelle, wet with perspiration. "'It sounds like someone in the last agonies,' said Lasse, and hastily drew on his trousers with trembling, clumsy hands. She surely hasn't laid hands upon herself. He lighted the lantern and went out into the stable, Pelle following naked. Then suddenly the cries ceased, as abruptly as if the sound had been cut off with an axe, and the silence that followed said dumbly that it was forever. The farm sank into the darkness of night like an extinguished world. Our mistress is dead, said Lasse shivering and moving his fingers over his lips. May God receive her kindly. They crept fearfully into bed. But when they got up the next morning, the farm looked as it always did, and the maids were chattering and making as much noise as usual in the wash-house. A little while after, the mistress's voice was heard up there, giving directions about the work. I don't understand it, said Lasse, shaking his head. Nothing but death can stop anything so suddenly. She must have a tremendous power over herself. It now became apparent what a capable woman she was. She had not wasted anything in the long period of idleness. The maids became brisker and the fare better. One day she came to the cow stable to see that the milking was done cleanly. She gave everyone his due, too. 
One day they came from the quarry and complained that they had had no wages for three weeks. There was not enough money on the farm. Then we must get some, said the mistress, and they had to set about threshing at once. And one day, when Karna raised too many objections, she received a ringing box on the ear. It's a new nature she's got, said Lasse. But the old workpeople recognized several things from their younger days. It's her family's nature, they said. She's a regular Kohler. The time passed without any change. She was as constant in her tranquility as she had been before constant in her misery. It was not the habit of the Kohlers to change their minds once they had made them up about anything. Then Kongstrup came home from his journey. She did not drive out to meet him, but was on the steps to greet him, gentle and kind. Everybody could see how pleased and surprised he was. He must have expected a very different reception. But during the night, when they were all sound asleep, Karna came knocking at the men's window. "'Get up and fetch the doctor,' she cried, "'and be quick.' The call sounded like one of life and death, and they turned out headlong. Lasse, who was in the habit of sleeping with one eye open, like the hens, was the first man on the spot, and had gotten the horses out of the stable. And in a few minutes Karl Johann was driving out at the gate. He had a man with him to hold the lantern. It was pitch dark, but they could hear the carriage tearing along until the sound became very distant. Then, in another moment, the sound changed, as the vehicle turned on to the metalled road a couple of miles off, then it died away altogether. On the farm, they went about shaking themselves and unable to rest, wandering into their rooms and out again to gaze up at the tall windows where people were running backward and forward with lights. What had happened? Some mishap to the farmer, evidently, for now and again the mistress's commanding voice could be heard down in the kitchen. But what? The wash-house and the servants' rooms were dark and locked. Toward morning, when the doctor had come and had taken things into his own hands, a greater calm fell upon them all and the maids took the opportunity of slipping out into the yard. They would not at once say what was the matter, but stood looking in an embarrassed way at one another and laughing stupidly. At last they gradually got it out, by first one telling a little and then another. In a fit of delirium or of madness, Kongstrup had done violence to himself. Their faces were contorted with a mixture of fear and smothered laughter and when Karl Johann said gravely to fair Maria, "'You're not telling a lie, are you?' she burst into tears. There she stood, laughing and crying by turns, and it made no difference that Karl Johann scolded her sharply. But it was true, although it sounded like the craziest nonsense, that a man could do such a thing to himself. It was a truth that struck one dumb. It was some time before they could make it out at all. But when they did, there were one or two things about it that seemed a little unnatural. It could not have happened during intoxication, for the farmer never drank at home, did not drink at all, as far as anyone knew, but only took a glass in good company. It was more likely to have been remorse and contrition. It was not impossible considering the life he had led, although it was strange that a man of his nature should behave in such a desperate fashion but it was not satisfactory, and gradually, without it being possible to point to any origin, all thoughts turned toward her. She had changed of late, and the Kohler blood had come out in her, and in that family they had never let themselves be trodden down unrevenged. End of chapter 19《of Pele the Conqueror, Volume One, by Martin Anderson Nexo, translated by Jesse Muir. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Out in the shelter of the gable wall of the house sat Kongstrup, well wrapped up and gazing straight before him, with expressionless eyes. The winter sun shone full upon him, 
It had lured forth signs of spring, and the sparrows were hopping gaily about him. His wife went backward and forward, busying herself about him. She wrapped his feet up better, and came with a shawl to put round his shoulders. She touched his chest and arms affectionately as she spread the shawl over him from behind, and he slowly raised his head and passed his hand over hers. She stood thus for a little while, leaning against his shoulder, and looking down upon him like a mother, with eyes that were tranquil with the joy of possession. Pelle came bounding down across the yard, licking his lips. He had taken advantage of his mistress's preoccupation to steal down into the dairy and get a drink of sour cream from the girls, and tease them a little. He was glowing with health, and moved along as carelessly happy as if the whole world were his. It was quite dreadful the way he grew and wore out his things. It was almost impossible to keep him in clothes. His arms and legs stuck far out of every article of clothing he put on, and he wore things out as fast as Lasse could procure them. Something new was always being got for him, and before you could turn round, his arms and legs were out of that too. He was as strong as an oak tree, and when it was a question of lifting, or anything that did not require perseverance, Lasse had to allow himself to be superseded. The boy had acquired independence, too, and every day it became more difficult for the old man to assert his parental authority. But that would come as soon as Lasse was master of his own house, and could bring his fist down on his own table. But when would that be? As matters now stood, it looked as if the magistrate did not want him and Madame Olsen to be decently married. Seaman Olsen had given plain warning of his decease, and Lasse thought there was nothing to do but put up the bands. But the authorities continued to raise difficulties and ferret about, in the true lawyer's way. Now there was one question that had to be examined into, and now another. There were periods of grace allowed, and summonses to be issued to the dead man to make his appearance within such and such a time, and what not besides. It was all a put-up job so that the pettifoggers could make something out of it. He was thoroughly tired of Stone Farm. Every day he made the same complaint to Pelle. It's nothing but toil, toil, from morning till night, one day just like another, all the year round, as if you were in a convict prison. And what you get for it is hardly enough to keep your body decently covered. You can't put anything by, and one day when you're worn out and good for nothing more, you can just go on the parish. The worst of it all, however, was the desire to work once more for himself. He was always sighing for this, and his hands were sore with longing to feel what it was like to take hold of one's own. Of late he had meditated cutting the matter short and moving down to his sweethearts without regard to the law. She was quite willing, he knew. She badly needed a man's hand in the house and they were being talked about anyhow. It would not make much difference if he and the boy went to her as lodgers, especially when they worked independently. But the boy was not to be persuaded. He was jealous for his father's honor. Whenever Lasse touched upon the subject, he became strangely sullen. Lasse pretended it was Madame Olsen's idea and not his. I'm not particularly in favor of it either, he said. People are sure to believe the worst at once, but we can't go on here wearing ourselves to a thread for nothing, and you can't breathe freely on this farm, always tied. Pelle made no answer to this. He was not strong in reasons, but knew what he wanted. If I ran away from here one night, I guess you'd come trotting after me. Pelle maintained a refractory silence. I think I'll do it. For this isn't to be born. Now you've got to have new school trousers, and where are they coming from? Well, then do it. Then you'll do what you say. It's easy for you to pooh-pooh everything, said Lasse despondingly, for you've time and years before you. But I'm beginning to get old, and I've no one to trouble about me. Why don't I help you with everything? 
asked Pelle reproachfully. Yes, yes, of course. You do your very best to make things easier for me. And no one could say you didn't. But, you see, there are certain things you don't. There's something. Lasse came to a standstill. What was the use of explaining the longings of a man to a boy? You shouldn't be so obstinate, you know. And Lasse stroked the boy's arm imploringly. But Pelle was obstinate. He had already put up with plenty of sarcastic remarks from his schoolfellows, and fought a good many battles since it had become known that his father and Madame Olsen were sweethearts. If they now started living together openly, it would become quite unbearable. Pelle was not afraid of fighting, but he needed to have right on his side if he was to kick out properly. Move down to her then, and I'll go away. Where'll you go to? Out into the world, and get rich. Lasse raised his head, like an old war-horse that hears a signal, but then it dropped again. Out into the world, and get rich. Yes, yes, he said slowly. That's what I thought, too, when I was your age. But things don't happen like that if you aren't born with a call. Lasse was silent, and thoughtfully kicked the straw in under a cow. He was not altogether sure that the boy was not born with a call after all. He was a late-born child, and they were always meant for the worst or the best. And then he had that cow's lick on his forehead, which meant good fortune. He was merry and always singing, and neat-handed at everything, and his nature made him generally liked. It was very possible that good fortune lay waiting for him somewhere out there. But the very first thing you need for that is to be properly confirmed. You'd better take your books and learn your lesson for the priest, so that you don't get refused. I'll do the rest of the foddering. Pelle took his books and seated himself in the foddering passage just in front of the big bull. He read in an undertone, and Lasse passed up and down at his work. For some time each minded his own, but then Lasse came up, drawn by the new lesson books Pelle had got for his confirmation classes. Is that Bible history, that one there? Yes. Is that about the man who drank himself drunk in there? Lasse had long since given up learning to read. He had not the head for it. But he was always interested in what the boy was doing, and the books exerted a peculiar magic effect upon him. Now, what does that stand for? He would ask wonderingly, pointing to something printed, or, What wonderful thing have you got in your lesson today? Pelle had to keep him informed from day to day, and the same questions often came again, for Lasse had not a good memory. You know, the one whose sons pulled off his trousers and shamed their own father. Lasse continued, when Pelle did not answer. Oh, Noah! Yes, of course, old Noah, the one that Gustav had that song about. I wonder what he made himself drunk on, the old man. Wine? Was it wine? Lasse raised his eyebrows. Then that Noah must have been a fine gentleman. The owner of the estate at home drank wine, too, on grand occasions. I've heard that it takes a lot of that to make a man tipsy, and it's expensive. Does the book tell you, too, about him that was such a terrible swindler? What was his name again? Laban, do you mean? Laban, yes, of course. To think that I could forget it, too for he was a regular Laban, so the name suits him just right. It was him that let his son-in-law have both daughters, and off their price on his daily wage, too. If they'd been alive now, they'd have got hard labor, both him and his son-in-law. But in those days the police didn't look so close at people's papers. Now I should like to know whether a wife was allowed to have two husbands in those days. Does the book say anything about that? Lasse moved his head inquisitively. No, I don't think it does, answered Pelle absently. Oh, well, I oughtn't to disturb you, said Lasse, and went back to his work. But in a very short time he was back again. Those two names have slipped my memory. I can't think where my head could have been at the moment. 
but I know the greater prophets well enough, if you like to hear me. Say them, then, said Pelle, without raising his eyes from his book. But you must stop reading while I say them, said Lasse, or you might go wrong. He did not approve of Pelle's wanting to treat it as food for babes. Well, I don't suppose I could go wrong in the four greater, said Pelle, with an air of superiority, but nevertheless shutting the book. Lasse took the quid out from his lower lip with his forefinger, and threw it on the ground so as to have his mouth clear, and then hitched up his trousers, and stood for a little while with closed eyes while he moved his lips in inward repetition. "'Are they coming soon?' asked Pelle. "'I must first make sure that they're there,' answered Lasse, in vexation at the interruption, and beginning to go over them again. "'Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel,' he said, dashing them off hastily so as not to lose any of them on the way. "'Shall we take Jacob's twelve sons, too?' "'No, not today. It might be too much for me all at once. At my age you must go forward gently. I'm not as young as you, you know. But you might go through the twelve lesser prophets with me.' Pelle went through them slowly and Lasse repeated them one by one. "'What confounded names they did think of in those days!' he exclaimed, quite out of breath. "'You can hardly get your tongue round them, but I shall manage them in time.' "'What do you want to know them for, father?' asked Pelle suddenly. "'What do I want to know them for?' Lasse scratched one ear. "'Why, of course I er. What a terrible stupid question!' What do you want to know them for? Learning's as good for the one to have as for the other. And in my youth they wouldn't let me get at anything fine like that. Do you want to keep it all to yourself? No, for I wouldn't care a hang about all this profit business if I didn't have to. Lasse almost fainted with horror. Then you're the most wicked little cub I ever knew, and deserve never to have been born into the world. Is that all the respect you have for learning? You ought to be glad. You were born in an age when the poor man's child shares in it all, as well as the rich. It wasn't so in my time, or else, who knows? Perhaps I shouldn't be going about here cleaning stables, if I'd learned something when I was young. Take care you don't take pride in your own shame. Pelle half regretted his words now, and said, to clear himself, I'm in the top form now. Yes, I know that well enough, but that's no reason for your putting your hands in your trouser pockets. While you're taking breath, the others eat the porridge. I hope you've not forgotten anything in the long Christmas holidays. Oh, no, I'm sure I haven't, said Pelle with assurance. Lasse did not doubt it either, but only made believe he did to take the boy in. He knew nothing more splendid than to listen to a rushing torrent of learning but it was becoming more and more difficult to get the laddie to contribute it. "'How can you be sure?' he went on. "'Hadn't you better see? It would be such a comfort to know that you hadn't forgotten anything, so much as you must have in your head.' Pelle felt flattered and yielded. He stretched out his legs, closed his eyes, and began to rock backward and forward. And the Ten Commandments, the Patriarchs, the Judges, Joseph and his brethren, the four major and the twelve minor prophets, the whole learning of the world poured from his lips in one long breath. To Lasse it seemed as if the universe itself were whizzing round the white-bearded countenance of the Almighty. He had to bend his head and cross himself in awe at the amount that the little boy's head could contain. I wonder what it costs to be a student said Lasse, when he once more felt earth beneath his feet. It must be expensive, a thousand kronas, I suppose, at least, Pelle thought. Neither of them connected any definite idea with the number. It merely meant the insurmountably great. I wonder if it would be so terribly dear, said Lasse. I've been thinking that when we have something of our own, I suppose it'll come to something some day. You might go to Fries and learn the trade of him fairly cheap, and have your meals at home. We ought to be able to manage it that way." Pelle did not answer. 
he felt no desire to be apprenticed to the clerk. He had taken out his knife, and was cutting something on the post of one of the stalls. It represented the big bull with his head down to the ground, and its tongue hanging out of one corner of its mouth. One hoof, right forward at its mouth, indicated that the animal was pawing up the ground in anger. Lasse could not help stopping, for now it was beginning to be like something. "'That's meant to be a cow, isn't it?' he said. He had been wondering every day, as it gradually grew. "'It's Volmer, that time he took you on his horns,' said Pelle. Lasse could see at once that it was that, now that he had been told. "'It's really very like,' he said. "'But he wasn't so angry as you've made him. "'Well, well, you'd better get to work again. "'That there fooling can't make a living for a man.' Lasse did not like this defect in the boy, making drawings with chalk or his penknife all over. There would soon not be a beam or a wall in the place that did not bear the marks of one or the other. It was useless nonsense, and the farmer would probably be angry if he came into the stable and happened to see them. Lasse had every now and then to throw cow dung over the most conspicuous drawings so that they should not catch the eye of the people for whom they were not intended. Up at the house, Kongstrup was just going in, leaning on his wife's arm. He looked pale, but by no means thin. "'He's still rather lame,' said Lasse, peeping out. "'But it won't be long before we have him down here, so you'd better not quite destroy the post.' Pelle went on cutting. If you don't leave off that silly nonsense, I'll throw dirt over it, said Lasse angrily. Then I'll draw you and Madame Olsen on the big gate, answered Pelle roguishly. You, you'd better. I should curse you before my face and get the parson to send you away, if not something worse. Lasse was quite upset and went down to the other end of the cow stable and began the afternoon's cleaning, knocking and pulling his implements about. In his anger he loaded the wheelbarrow too full, and then could neither go one way nor the other, as his feet slipped. Pelle came down with the gentlest of faces. "'Mayn't I wheel the barrow out?' he said. "'Your wooden shoes aren't so firm on the stones.' Lasse growled some reply, and let him take it. For a very short time he was cross, but it did no good. The boy could be irresistible when he liked." End of chapter 20and the bailiff had driven into the town, so Eric was sitting over the stove. He never said anything of his own accord, but always sat and stared, and his eyes followed Pelle's movements backward and forward between his mouth and his plate. He always kept his eyebrows raised, as if everything were new to him. They had almost grown into that position. In front of him stood a mug of beer in a large pool, for he drank constantly and spilt some every time. Fair Maria was washing up, and looked in every now and then to see if Pelle were finished. When he licked his horn spoon clean, and threw it into the drawer, she came in with something on a plate. They had had roast loin of pork for dinner upstairs. "'Here's a little taste for you,' she said. "'I expect you're still hungry. What'll you give me for it?' She kept the plate in her hand and looked at him with a coaxing smile. Pelle was still very hungry, ravenous, and he looked at the tidbit until his mouth watered. Then he dutifully put up his lips, and Maria kissed him. She glanced involuntarily at Eric, and a gleam of something passed over his foolish face like a faint reminiscence. "'There sits that great gaby making a mess,' she said, scolding as she seized the beer-mug from him held it under the edge of the table, and with her hand swept the spilt beer into it. Pelle set to work upon the pork without troubling about anything else, but when she had gone out 
he carefully spat down between his legs and went through a small cleansing operation with the sleeve of his blouse. When he was finished, he went into the stable and cleaned out the mangers, while Lasse curried the cows. It was all to look nice for Sunday. While they worked, Pelle gave a full account of the day's happenings, and repeated all that the parson had said. Lasse listened attentively, with occasional little exclamations. Think of that! Well, I never! So David was a buck like that, and yet he walked in the sight of God all the same. Well, God's long-suffering is great, there's no mistake about that. There was a knock at the outer door. It was one of Kala's children, with the message that Grandmother would like to bid them good-bye before she passed away. "'Then she can't have long to live,' exclaimed Lasse. "'It'll be a great loss to them all, so happy as they've been together. But there'll be a little more food for the others, of course.' They agreed to wait until they were quite finished, and then steal away, for if they asked to be let off early, they would not be likely to get leave for the funeral. And that'll be a day's feasting, with plenty of food and drink, if I know anything of Brother Kala," said Lasse. When they had finished their work and had their supper, they stole out through the outside door into the field. Lasse had heaped up the quilt and put an old woolly cap just sticking out at the pillow end. In a hurry, it could easily be mistaken for the hair of a sleeper, if anyone came to see. When they had got a little way, Lasse had to go back once more to take precautions against fire. It was snowing gently and silently, and the ground was frozen, so that they could go straight on over everything. Now that they knew the way, it seemed no distance at all, and before they knew where they were, the fields came to an end and the rock began. There was a light in the cottage. Kala was sitting up waiting for them. Grandmother hasn't long to live, he said, more seriously than Lasse ever remembered to have heard him speak before. Kala opened the door to Grandmother's room and whispered something, to which his wife answered softly out of the darkness. Oh, I'm awake, said the old woman in a slow, monotonous voice. You can speak out, for I am awake. Lasse and Pelle took off their leather shoes and went in in their stockings. Good evening, Grandmother, they both said solemnly. And the peace of God, Lasse added. Well, here I am, said the old woman, feebly patting the quilt. She had big woolen gloves on. I took the liberty of sending for you, for I haven't long to live now. How are things going on in the parish? Have there been any deaths? No, not that I know of, answered Lasse. But you look so well, grandmother, so fat and rosy. We shall see you going about again in two or three days. Oh, I dare say, said the old woman, smiling indulgently. I suppose I look like a young bride after her first baby, eh? But thank you for coming. It's as if you belong to me. Well, now I've been sent for, and I shall depart in peace. I've had a good time in this world, and haven't anything to complain of. I had a good husband and a good daughter, not forgetting Kala there. And I got my sight back, so that I saw the world once more. But you only saw it with one eye, like the birds, grandmother, said Kala, trying to laugh. Yes, yes. But that was quite good enough. There was so much that was new since I lost my sight. The wood had grown bigger, and a whole family had grown up without my quite knowing it. Ah, yes, it has been good to live in my old age, and have them all about me. Kala and Maria and the children, and all of my own age have gone before me. It's been nice to see what became of them all. How old are you now, grandmother? asked Lasse. Kala has looked it up in the church book, and from that I ought to be almost eighty, but that can scarcely be right. Yes, it's right enough, said Kala, for the parson looked it up for me himself. Well, well, then the time's gone quickly, and I shouldn't at all mind living a little longer, if it was God's will. But the grave's giving warning. 
I notice it in my eyelids. The old woman had a little difficulty in breathing, but kept on talking. You're talking far too much, mother, said Maria. Yes, you ought to be resting and sleeping, said Lasse. Hadn't we better say good-bye to you? No, I really must talk, for it'll be the last time I see you, and I shall have plenty of time to rest. My eyes are so light, thank God, and I don't feel the least bit sleepy. Grandmother hasn't slept for a whole week, I think, said Kala doubtfully. And why should I sleep away the last of the time I shall have here, when I shall get plenty of time for that afterward? At night, when you others are asleep, I lie and listen to your breathing, and feel glad that you're all so well. Or I look at the heather broom, and think of Anders, and all the fun we had together." She lay silent for a little while, getting her breath, while she gazed at the withered bunch of heather hanging from a beam. He gathered that for me the last time we lay in the flowering heather. He was so uncommonly fond of the heather was Anders. And every year when it flowered, he took me out of my bed and carried me out there, every year until he was called away. I was always as new for him as on the first day, and so happiness and joy took up their abode in my heart. Now, mother, you ought to be quiet and not talk so much, said Maria, smoothing the old woman's pillow. But she would not be silenced, though her thoughts shifted a little. Yes, my teeth were hard to get and hard to lose, and I brought my children into the world with pain, and laid them in the grave with sorrow, one after another. But except for that, I've never been ill, and I've had a good husband. He had an eye for God's creations, and we got up with the birds every summer morning, and went out onto the heath, and saw the sun rise out of the sea before we set about our day's work. The old woman's slow voice died away, and it was as though a song ceased to sound in their ears. They sat up and sighed. Ah, yes, said Lasse, the voice of memory is pleasant. What about you, Lasse? said the old woman suddenly. I hear you're looking for a wife. Am I? exclaimed Lasse in alarm. Pelle saw Kala wink at Maria so they knew about it, too. "'Aren't you soon coming to show us your sweetheart?' asked Kala. "'I hear it's a good match.' "'I don't in the least know what you're talking about,' said Lasse, quite confused. "'Well, well, you might do worse than that,' said the grandmother. "'She's good enough, from what I know. I hope you'll suit one another like Anders and me. It was a happy time.' the days when we went about and each did our best, and the nights when the wind blew. It was good then to be two, to keep one another warm." "'You've been very happy in everything, Grandmother,' exclaimed Lasse. "'Yes, and I'm departing in peace, and can lie quiet in my grave. I've not been treated unfairly in any way, and I've got nothing to haunt any one for. If only Kala takes care to have me carried out feet first, I don't expect I shall trouble you. You just come and visit us now and then if you like. We shan't be afraid to welcome you, for we've been so happy together here," said Kala. No, you never know what your nature may be in the next life. You must promise to have me carried out feet first. I don't want to disturb your night's rest, so hard as you two have to work all day. And besides, you've had to put up with me long enough. And it'll be nice for you to be by yourselves for once. And there'll be a bit more for you to eat after this." Maria began to cry. "'Now look here,' exclaimed Kala testily. "'I won't hear any more of that nonsense, for none of us have had to go short because of you. If you aren't good, I shall have a big party after you, for joy that you're gone. No, you won't, said the old woman quite sharply. I won't hear of a three days wake. Promise me now, Maria, that you won't go and ruin yourselves to make a fuss over a poor old soul like me. But you must ask the nearest neighbors in in the afternoon, with Lasse and Pelle, of course. And if you ask Hans Henrik, perhaps he'd bring his concertina with him, and you could have a dance in the barn. 
Kala scratched the back of his head. Then hang it! You must wait until I finish threshing, for I can't clear the floor now. Couldn't we borrow Yen's cure's horse and take a little drive over the heath in the afternoon? You might do that, too, but the children are to have a share in whatever you settle to do. It'll be a comfort to think they'll have a happy day out of it, for they don't have too many holidays, and there's money for it, you know. Yes, would you believe it, Lasse? Grandmother's got together fifty kronas that none of us knew anything about to go toward her funeral party. I've been putting by for it for twenty years now, for I'd like to leave the world in a decent way and without pulling the clothes off my relations' backs. My grave clothes are all ready, too, for I've got my wedding chemise lying by. It's only been used once, and more than that, and my cap I don't want to have on. But that's so little, objected Maria. Whatever will the neighbors say if we don't dress you properly? I don't care, answered the old woman decidedly. That's how Anders liked me best, and it's all I've worn in bed these sixty years, so there. And she turned her head to the wall. You shall have it all just as you like, mother, said Maria. The old woman turned round again and felt for her daughter's hand on the quilt. And you must make rather a soft pillow for my old head, for it's become so difficult to find rest for it. We can take one of the baby's pillows and cover it with white, said Maria. Thank you. And then I think you should send to Jacob Christians for the carpenter tomorrow. He's somewhere about anyhow, and let him measure me for the coffin. Then I could have my say as to what it's to be like. Call us so free with his money. The old woman closed her eyes. She had tired herself out after all. Now I think we'll creep out into the other room and let her be quiet," whispered Kala, getting up. But at that she opened her eyes. "'Are you going already?' she asked. "'We thought you were asleep, Grandmother,' said Lasse. "'No, I don't suppose I shall sleep any more in this life. My eyes are so light, so light. Well, good-bye to you, Lasse and Pelle. May you be very, very happy, as happy as I've been. Maria was the only one death spared, and she's been a good daughter to me. And Kala's been as good and kind to me as if I'd been his sweetheart. I had a good husband, too, who chopped firewood for me on Sundays, and got up in the night to look after the babies when I was lying in. We were really well off, lead weights in the clock and plenty of firing and he promised me a trip to Copenhagen. I churned my first butter in a bottle, for we had no churn to begin with, and I had to break the bottle to get it out, and then he laughed, for he always laughed when I did anything wrong. And how glad he was when each baby was born! Many a morning did he wake me up, and we went out to see the sun come up out of the sea. "'Come and see, Anna,' he would say. The heathers come into bloom in the night, but it was only the sun that shed its red over it. It was more than two miles to our nearest neighbor, but he didn't care for anything as long as he had me. He found his greatest pleasures in me, poor as I was, and the animals were fond of me too. Everything went well with us on the whole. She lay moving her head from side to side, and the tears were running down her cheeks. She no longer had difficulty in breathing, and one thing recalled another, and fell easily into one long tone from her lips. She probably did not know what she was saying, but could not stop talking. She began at the beginning and repeated the words, evenly and monotonously, like one who was carried away and must talk. "'Mother,' said Maria anxiously, putting her hands on her mother's shaking head, Recollect yourself, mother. The old woman stopped and looked at her wonderingly. Ah, yes, she said. Memories came upon me so fast. I almost think I could sleep a little now. Lasse rose and went up to the bed. Good-bye, grandmother, he said, and a pleasant journey, in case we shouldn't meet again. 
Pelle followed him and repeated the words. The old woman looked at them inquiringly, but did not move. Then Lasse gently took her hand, and then Pelle, and they stole out into the other room. "'Her flame's burning clear to the end,' said Lasse when the door was shut. Pelle noticed how freely their voices rang again. "'Yes, she'll be herself to the very end. There's been extra good timber in her. The people about here don't like our not having the doctor to her. What do you think? Shall we go to the expense?' "'I don't suppose there's anything more the matter with her than that she can't live any longer,' said Lasse thoughtfully. "'No, and she won't hear of it. If he could only keep her in life a little while longer—' "'Yes, times are hard,' said Lasse, and went round to look at the children. They were all asleep, and their room seemed heavy with their breathing. "'The flock's getting much smaller.' "'Yes, one or two fly away from the nest pretty well every year,' answered Kalle. "'And now I suppose we shan't have any more. "'It's an unfortunate figure we've stopped at, a horrid figure. "'But Maria's become deaf in that ear, and I can't do anything alone.' Kalle had got back his roguish look. "'I'm sure we can do very well with what we've got,' said Maria. "'When we take Anna's, too, it makes fourteen. "'Oh, yes.' count the others, too, and you'll get off all the easier," said Kalle teasingly. Lasse was looking at Anna's child, which lay side by side with Kalle's thirteenth. "'She looks healthier than her aunt,' he said. "'You'd scarcely think they were the same age. She's just as red as the other's pale.' "'Yes, there is a difference,' Kalle admitted, looking affectionately at the children. "'It must be that Anna's has come from young people while our blood's beginning to get old. And then the ones that come the wrong side of the blanket always thrive best, like our Albert, for instance. He carries himself quite differently from the others. Did you know, by the by, that he's to get a ship of his own next spring? No, surely not. Is he really going to be a captain? said Lasse, in the utmost astonishment. It's Kongstrup that's at the back of that. That's between ourselves, of course. Does the father of Anna's child still pay what he's bound to? asked Lasse. Yes, he's honest enough. We get five kronas a month for having the child, and that's a good help toward expenses. Maria had placed a dram, bread, and a saucer of dripping on the table, and invited them to take their places at it. You're holding out for a long time at Stone Farm, said Kalle when they were seated. "'Are you going to stay there all your life?' he asked, with a mischievous wink. "'It's not such a simple matter to strike out into the deep,' said Lasse evasively. "'Oh, we shall soon be hearing news from you, shan't we?' asked Maria. Lasse did not answer. He was struggling with a crust. "'Oh, but do cut off the crust if it's too much for your teeth,' said Maria. Every now and then she listened at her mother's door. "'She's dropped off, after all, poor old soul,' she said. Kalle pretended to discover the bottle for the first time. "'What? Why, we've got gin on the table, too, and not one of us has smelt it,' he exclaimed, and filled their glasses for the third time. Then Maria corked the bottle. "'Do you even grudge us our food?' he said, making great eyes at her. What a rogue he was!' and Maria stared at him with eyes that were just as big, and said, "'Ya, yeah, you want to fight, do you?' It quite warmed Lasse's heart to see their happiness. "'How's the farmer at Stone Farm? I suppose he's got over the worst now, hasn't he?' said Kalle. "'Well, I think he's as much a man as he'll ever be. A thing like that leaves its mark upon anyone,' answered Lasse. Maria was smiling and as soon as they looked at her, she looked away. "'Yes, you may grin,' said Lasse, "'but I think it's sad.' Upon which Maria had to go out into the kitchen to have her laugh out. "'That's what all the women do at the mere mention of his name,' said Kalle. "'It's a sad change. Today red, tomorrow dead. Well, she's got her own way in one thing, and that is that she keeps him to herself, 
in a way, but to think that he can live with her after that. They seem fonder of one another than they ever were before. He can't do without her for a single minute. But of course he wouldn't find anyone else to love him now. What a queer sort of devilment love is. But we must see about getting home. Well, I'll send you word when she's to be buried, said Kala, when they got outside the house. Yes, do. And if you should be in want of a ten krona note for the funeral, let me know. Goodbye, then. End of chapter 21「Chapter Twenty Two of Pele the Conqueror, Volume One by Martin Anderson Nexo, translated by Jesse Muir. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Grandmother's funeral was still like a bright light behind everything that one thought and did. It was like certain kinds of food that leave a pleasant taste in the mouth long after they have been eaten and done with. Kala had certainly done everything to make it a festive day. There was an abundance of good things to eat and drink, and no end to its comical tricks. And, sly dog that he was, he had found an excuse for asking Madame Olsen. It was really a nice way of making the relation a legitimate one. It gave Lasse and Pelle enough to talk about for a whole month, and after the subject was quite talked out and laid on one side for other things, it remained in the background as a sense of well-being of which no one quite knew the origin. But now spring was advancing, and with it came troubles. Not the daily trifles that could be bad enough, but great troubles that darkened everything, even when one was not thinking about them. Pelle was to be confirmed at Easter, and Lasse was at his wit's end to know how he was going to get him all that he would need new clothes, new cap, new shoes. The boy often spoke about it. He must have been afraid of being put to shame before the others that day in church. "'It'll be all right,' said Lasse, but he himself saw no way at all out of the difficulty. At all the farms where the good old customs prevailed, the master and mistress provided it all. Out here everything was so confoundedly new-fangled with prompt payments that slipped away between one's fingers. A hundred kronas a year in wages seemed a tremendous amount when one thought of it all in one, but you only got them gradually, a few auras at a time, without your being able to put your finger anywhere and say, you got a good round sum there. Yes, yes, it'll be all right, said Lasse aloud, when he had got himself entangled in absurd speculations and Pelle had to be satisfied with this. There was only one way out of the difficulty, to borrow the money from Madame Olsen, and that Lasse would have to come to in the end, loath as he was to do it. But Pelle must not know anything about it. Lasse refrained as long as he possibly could, hoping that something or other would turn up to free him from the necessity of so disgraceful a proceeding as borrowing from his sweetheart. But nothing happened, and time was passing. One morning he cut the matter short. Pelle was just setting out for school. "'Will you run in to Madame Olsen's and give her this?' he said, handing the boy a packet. "'It's something she promised to mend for us.' Inside on the paper was the large cross that announced Lasse's coming in the evening. From the hills Pelle saw that the ice had broken up in the night. It had filled the bay for nearly a month with a rough, compact mass, upon which you could play about as safely as on dry land. This was a new side of the sea, and Pelle had carefully felt his way forward with the tips of his wooden shoes, to the great amusement of the others. Afterward he learned to walk about freely on the ice without constantly shivering at the thought that the great fish of the sea were going about just under his wooden shoes and perhaps were only waiting for him to drop through. Every day he went out to the high rampart of pack ice that formed the boundary about a mile out, where the open water moved round in the sunshine like a green eye. He went out because he would do what the others did, but he never felt safe on the sea. Now it was all broken up, and the bay was full of heaving ice floes 
that rubbed against one another with a crackling sound, and the pieces farthest out, carrying bits of the rampart, were already on their way out to sea. Pelle had performed many exploits out there, but was really quite pleased that it was now packing up and taking its departure, so that it would once more be no crime to stay on dry land. Old Fries was sitting in his place. He never left it now during a lesson, however badly things might go down in the class, but contented himself with beating on the desk with his cane. He was little more than a shadow of his former self. His head was always shaking, and his hands were often incapable of grasping an object. He still brought the newspaper with him, and opened it out at the beginning of the lesson, but he did not read. He would fall into a dream, sitting bolt upright, with his hands on the desk and his back against the wall. At such times the children could be as noisy as they liked, and he did not move. Only a slight change in the expression of his eyes showed that he was alive at all. It was quieter in school now. It was not worth while teasing the master, for he scarcely noticed it, and so the fun lost most of its attraction. A kind of court of justice had gradually formed among the bigger boys. They determined the order of the school lessons, and disobedience and disputes as to authority were respectively punished and settled in the playground with fists and tips of wooden shoes. The instruction was given as before by the cleverer scholars teaching what they knew to the others. There was rather more arithmetic and reading than in Fries's time, but on the other hand the hymns suffered. It still sometimes happened that Fries woke up and interfered in the instruction. Hymns! he would cry in his feeble voice and strike the desk from habit and the children would put aside what they were doing to please the old man and begin repeating some hymn or other, taking their revenge by going through one verse over and over again for a whole hour. It was the only real trick they played the old man, and the joke was all on their side, for Fries noticed nothing. Fries had so often talked of resigning his post, but now he did not even think of that. He shuffled to and from school at the regular times, probably without even thinking he did it. The authorities really had not the heart to dismiss him, except in the hymns, which came off with rather short measure. There was nothing to say against him as teacher, for no one had ever yet left his school without being able both to write his name and to read a printed book, if it were in the old type. The new-fashioned printing with Latin letters Fries did not teach, although he had studied Latin in his youth. Fries himself probably did not feel the change, for he had ceased to feel both for himself and for others. None now brought their human sorrows to him, and found comfort in a sympathetic mind. His mind was not there to consult. It floated outside him, half detached, as it were, like a bird that is unwilling to leave its old nest and set out on a flight to the unknown. It must have been the fluttering mind that his eyes were always following when they dully gazed about into vacancy. But the young men who came home to winter in the village, and went to Fries as an old friend, felt the change. For them there was now an empty place at home. They missed the old growler, who, though he hated them in the lump at school, loved them all afterward, and was always ready with his ridiculous, he was my best boy about each and all of them, good and bad alike. The children took their playtime early and rushed out before Pelle had given the signal, and Fries trotted off as usual into the village, where he would be absent the customary two hours. The girls gathered in a flock to eat their dinners, and the boys dashed about the playground like birds let loose from a cage. Pelle was quite angry at the insubordination and pondered over a way of making himself respected, for today he had had the other big boys against him. He dashed over the playground like a circling gull, his body inclined and his arms stretched out like a pair of wings. Most of them made room for him, and those who did not move willingly were made to do so. His position was threatened, and he kept moving incessantly, 
as if to keep the question undecided until a possibility of striking presented itself. This went on for some time. He knocked some over and hit out at others in his flight, while his offended sense of power grew. He wanted to make enemies of them all. They began to gather up by the gymnastic apparatus, and suddenly he had the whole pack upon him. He tried to rise and shake them off, flinging them hither and thither, but all in vain. Down through the heap came their remorseless knuckles and made him grin with pain. He worked away indefatigably, but without effect, until he lost patience and resorted to less scrupulous tactics, thrusting his fingers into eyes, or attacking noses, windpipes, or any vulnerable part he could get at. That thinned them out, and he was able to rise and fling a last little fellow across the playground. Pelle was well bruised and quite out of breath, but contented. They all stood by gaping and let him brush himself down. He was the victor. He went across to the girls with his torn blouse, and they put it together with pins and gave him sweets, and in return he fastened two of them together by their plates, and they screamed and let him pull them about without being cross. It was all just as it should be. But he was not quite secure after his victory. He could not, like Henry Boker in his time, walk right through the whole flock with his hands in his pockets directly after a battle, and look as if they did not exist. He had to keep stealing glances at them while he strolled down to the beach, and tried with all his might to control his breathing, for next to crying, to be out of breath was the greatest disgrace that could happen to you. Pelle walked along the beach, regretting that he had not leaped upon them again at once while the flush of victory was still upon him. It was too late now. If he had, it might perhaps have been said of him, too, that he could lick all the rest of the class together, and now he must be content with being the strongest boy in the school. A wild war-whoop from the class made him start. The whole swarm of boys was coming round the end of the house with sticks and pieces of wood in their hands. Pelle knew what was at stake if he gave way, and therefore forced himself to stand quietly waiting, although his legs twitched. But suddenly they made a wild rush at him, and with a spring he turned to fly. There lay the sea barring his way, closely packed with heaving ice. He ran out onto an ice floe, leaped from it to the next, which was not large enough to bear him, had to go on. The idea of flight possessed him and made the fear of what lay behind overpoweringly great. The lumps of ice gave way beneath him, and he had to leap from piece to piece. His feet moved as fast as fingers over the notes of a piano. He just noticed enough to take the direction toward the harbor breakwater. The others stood gaping at the beach while Pelle danced upon the water like a stone making ducks and drakes. The pieces of ice bobbed under as soon as he touched them, or turned up on edge, but Pelle came and slid by with a touch, flung himself to one side with lightning rapidity, and changed his aim in the middle of a leap like a cat. It was like a dance on red-hot iron. So quickly did he pick up his feet and spring from one place to another. The water spurted up from the pieces of ice as he touched them and behind him stretched a crooked track of disturbed ice and water, right back to the place where the boys stood and held their breath. There was nobody like Pelle. Not one of them could do what he had done there. When with a final leap he threw himself upon the breakwater, they cheered him. Pelle had triumphed in his flight. He lay upon the breakwater, exhausted and gasping for breath and gazed without interest at a brig that had cast anchor off the village. A boat was rowing in, perhaps with a sick man to be put in quarantine. The weather-beaten look of the vessel told of her having been out on a winter voyage in ice and heavy seas. Fishermen came down from the cottages and strolled out to the place where the boat would come in, and all the schoolchildren followed. In the stern of the boat sat an elderly weather-beaten man with a fringe of beard round his face. 
He was dressed in blue, and in front of him stood a sea chest. "'Why, it's Boat Swain Olsen!' Pelle heard one fisherman say. Then the man stepped ashore and shook hands with them all, and the fisherman and the schoolchildren closed round him in a dense circle. Pelle made his way up, creeping along behind boats and sheds, and as soon as he was hidden by the school building he set off running straight across the fields to Stone Farm. His vexation burnt his throat, and a feeling of shame made him keep far away from houses and people. The parcel, that he had had no opportunity of delivering in the morning, was like a clear proof to everybody of his shame, and he threw it into the marl pit as he ran. He would not go through the farm, but thundered on the outside door to the stable. "'Have you come home already?' exclaimed Lasse, pleased. "'Now, now Madame Olsen's husband's come home,' panted Pelle, and went past his father without looking at him. To Lasse it was as if the world had burst and falling fragments were piercing into his flesh. Everything was failing him. He moved about trembling and unable to grasp anything. He could not talk. Everything in him seemed to have come to a standstill. He had picked up a piece of rope and was going backward and forward, backward and forward, looking up. Then Pelle went up to him. "'What are you going to do with that?' he asked harshly. Lasse let the rope fall from his hand and began to complain of the sadness and poverty of existence. One feather fell off here and another there, until at last you stood trampling in the mud like a featherless bird, old and worn out and robbed of every hope of a happy old age. He went on complaining in this way in an undertone, and it eased him. Pelle made no response. He only thought of the wrong and the shame that had come upon them, and found no relief. Next morning he took his dinner and went off as usual, but when he was halfway to school he lay down under a thorn. There he lay, fuming and half-frozen, until it was about the time when school would be over, when he went home. This he did for several days. Toward his father he was silent, almost angry. Lasse went about lamenting, and Pelle had enough with his own trouble. Each moved in his own world, and there was no bridge between. Neither of them had a kind word to say to the other. But one day when Pelle came stealing home in this way, Lasse received him with a radiant face and weak knees. "'What on earth's the good of fretting?' he said, screwing up his face and turning his blinking eyes upon Pelle for the first time since the bad news had come. "'Look here at the new sweetheart I've found. Kiss her, laddie.' And Lasse drew from the straw a bottle of gin and held it out toward him. Pelle pushed it angrily from him. "'Oh, you're too grand, are you?' exclaimed Lasse. "'Well, well, it would be a sin and a shame to waste good things upon you.' He put the bottle to his lips and threw his head back. "'Father, you shan't do that!' exclaimed Pelle, bursting into tears and shaking his father's arm so that the liquid splashed out. "'Oh, ho!' said Lasse in astonishment, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. "'She's uncommonly lively, ho, ho!' He grasped the bottle with both hands and held it firmly, as if it had tried to get away from him. "'So you're obstreperous, are you?' Then his eye fell upon Pelle and you're crying. Has any one hurt you? Don't you know that your father's called Lasse, Lasse Carlson from Kungstrup? You needn't be afraid, for Lasse's here, and he'll make the whole world answer for it. Pelle saw that his father was quickly becoming more fuddled, and ought to be put to bed, for fear someone should come and find him lying there. Come now, father, he begged. Yes, I'll go now. I'll make him pay for it. If it's old Beelzebub himself, you needn't cry. Lasse was making for the yard. Pelle stood in front of him. Now you must come with me, father. There's no one to make pay for anything. Isn't there? And yet you're crying. But the farmer shall answer to me for all these years. Yes, my fine landed gentleman, with your nose turned up at every one. 
This made Pelle afraid. But father, father, he cried, don't go up there. He'll be in such a rage he'll turn us out. Remember, you're drunk. Yes, of course I'm drunk, but there's no harm in me. He stood fumbling with the hook that fastened the lower half of the door. It was wrong to lay a hand upon one's own father, but now Pelle was compelled to set aside all such scruples. He took a firm hold of the old man's collar. Now you come with me, he said, and drew him along toward their room. Lasse laughed and hiccuped and struggled, clutched hold of everything that he could lay hands on, the posts and the animal's tails, while Pelle dragged him along. He had hold of him behind, and was half carrying him. In the doorway they stuck fast, as the old man held on with both hands, and Pelle had to leave go of him, and knock his arms away so that he fell, and then drag him along, and on to the bed. Lasse laughed foolishly all the time, as if it were a game. Once or twice when Pelle's back was turned, he tried to get up. His eyes had almost disappeared, but there was a cunning expression about his mouth, and he was like a naughty child. Suddenly he fell back in a heavy sleep. The next day was a school holiday, so there was no need for Pelle to hide himself. Lasse was ashamed, and crept about with an air of humility. He must have had quite a clear idea of what had happened the day before, for suddenly he touched Pelle's arm. "'You're like Noah's good son, that covered up his father's shame,' he said. "'But Lasse's a beast. It's been a hard blow on me, as you may well believe. But I know quite well that it doesn't mend matters to drink oneself silly.' It's a badly buried trouble that one has to lay with gin, and what's hidden in the snow comes up in the thaw, as the saying is. Pelle made no answer. How do people take it? asked Lasse cautiously. He had now got so far as to have a thought for the shameful side of the matter. I don't think they know about it yet here on the farm, but what do they say outside? How should I know? answered Pelle sulkily. Then you've heard nothing. Do you suppose I go to school to be jeered at by them all? Pelle was almost crying again. Then you've been wandering about and let your father believe you'd gone to school. That wasn't right of you, but I won't find fault with you, considering all the disgrace I've brought upon you. But suppose you get into trouble for playing truant, even if you don't deserve it. Misfortunes go hand in hand, and evils multiply like lice in a fur coat. We must think what we're about, we two. We mustn't let things go all to pieces. Lasse walked quickly into their room, and returned with the bottle, took out the cork, and let the gin run slowly out into the gutter. Pelle looked wonderingly at him. God forgive me for abusing his gifts, said Lasse, but it's a bad tempter to have at hand when you've a sore heart. And now if I give you my word that you shall never again see me as I was yesterday— won't you have a try at school again tomorrow, and try to get over it gradually? We might get into trouble with the magistrate himself if you keep on staying away, for there's a heavy punishment for that sort of thing in this country. Pelle promised and kept his word, but he was prepared for the worst, and secretly slipped a knuckle-duster into his pocket that Eric had used in his palmy days when he went to open-air fates and other places where one had to strike a blow for one's girl. It was not required, however, for the boys were generally taken up with a ship that had had to be run aground to prevent her sinking, and now lay discharging her cargo of wheat into the boats of the village. The wheat already lay in the harbor in great piles, wet and swollen with the salt water. And a few days later, when this had become stale, Something happened which put a stop forever to Pelle's school attendance. The children were busy at arithmetic, chattering and clattering with their slates, and Fries was sitting as usual in his place, with his head against the wall and his hands resting on the desk. His dim eyes were somewhere out in space, and not a movement betrayed that he was alive. It was his usual position, and he had sat thus ever since playtime. The children grew restless. It was nearly time for them to go home. A farmer's son who had a watch 
held it up so that Pelle could see it, and said too, aloud. They noisily put away their slates and began to fight, but Fries, who generally awoke at the noise of departure, did not stir. Then they tramped out, and in passing, one of the girls, out of mischief, stroked the master's hand. She started back in fear. "'He's quite cold,' she said, shuddering and drawing back behind the others. They stood in a semicircle round the desk and tried to see into Fries's half-closed eyes, and then Pelle went up the two steps and laid his hand upon his master's shoulder. "'We're going home,' he said in an unnatural voice. Fries's arm dropped stiffly down from the desk, and Pelle had to support his body. "'He's dead!' The words passed like a shiver over the children's lips. Fries was dead, dead at his post, as the honest folks of the parish expressed it. Pelle had finished his schooling for good, and could breathe freely. He helped his father at home, and they were happy together and drew together again now that there was no third person to stand between them. The jibes from the others on the farm were not worth taking notice of. Lasse had been a long time on the farm, and knew too much about each of them, so that he could talk back. He sunned himself in Pelle's gently childlike nature, and kept up a continual chatter. One thing he was always coming back to. I ought to be glad I had you for if you hadn't held back that time when I was bent upon moving down to Madame Olson's, we should have been in the wrong box. I should think he'd have killed us in anger. You were my good angel, as you always have been. Lasse's words had the pleasant effect of caresses on Pelle. He was happy in it all, and was more of a child than his years would have indicated. But one Saturday he came home from the Parsons, altogether changed. He was as slow about everything as a dead herring, and did not go across to his dinner, but came straight in through the outer door, and threw himself face downward upon a bundle of hay. "'What's the matter now?' asked Lasse, coming up to him. "'Has any one been unkind to you?' Pelle did not answer, but lay plucking at the hay. Lasse was going to turn his face up to him, but Pelle buried it in the hay. "'Won't you trust your own father?' You know I've no other wish in the world but for your good. Lasse's voice was sad. I'm going to be turned out of the confirmation class, Pelle managed to say, and then burrowed into the hay to keep back his tears. Oh, no, surely not. Lasse began to tremble. Whatever have you done? I've half killed the parson's son. Oh, that's about the worst thing you could have done. Lift your hand against the parson's son. I'm sure he must have deserved it, but still you shouldn't have done it. Unless he's accused you of thieving, for no honest man need stand that from any one, not even the king himself. He, he called you Madame Olson's concubine. Pelle had some difficulty in getting this out. Lasse's mouth grew hard, and he clenched his fists. Oh, he did! Oh, did he! If I had him here, I'd kick his guts out, the young monkey. I hope you gave him something he'll remember for a long time. Oh, no, it wasn't very much, for he wouldn't stand up to me. He threw himself down and screamed, and then the parson came. For a little while Lasse's face was disfigured with rage, and he kept uttering threats. Then he turned to Pelle. And they've turned you out, only because you stood up for your old father. I'm always to bring misfortune upon you, though I'm only thinking of your good. But what shall we do now? I won't stay here any longer, said Pelle decidedly. No, let's get away from here. Nothing has ever grown on this farm for us two but wormwood. Perhaps there are new happy days waiting for us out there, and there are parsons everywhere. If we two work together at some good work out there, we shall earn a peck of money. Then one day we'll go up to a parson and throw down half a hundred kronas in front of his face, and it'd be funny if he didn't confirm you on the spot, and perhaps let himself be kicked into the bargain. Those kind of folk are very fond of money. Lasse had grown more erect in his anger, and had a keen look in his eyes. He walked quickly along the foddering passage, and threw the things about carelessly, 
for Pelle's adventurous proposal had infected him with youth. In the intervals of their work, they collected all their little things and packed the green chest. "'What a surprise it'll be tomorrow morning when they come here and find the nest empty,' said Pelle gaily. Lasse chuckled. Their plan was to take shelter with Kala for a day or two, while they took a survey of what the world offered. When everything was done in the evening, they took the green chest between them and stole out through the outside door into the field. The chest was heavy, and the darkness did not make walking easier. They moved on a little way, changed hands, and rested. "'We've got the night before us,' said Lasse cheerfully. He was quite animated, and while they sat resting upon the chest, talked about everything that awaited them. When he came to a standstill, Pelle began. Neither of them had made any distinct plans for their future. They simply expected a fairy story itself, with its inconceivable surprises. All the definite possibilities that they were capable of picturing to themselves fell so far short of that which must come, that they left it alone and abandoned themselves to what lay beyond their powers of foresight. Lasse was not sure-footed in the dark, and had more and more frequently to put down his burden. He grew weary and breathless, and the cheerful words died away upon his lips. "'Ah, how heavy it is!' he sighed. "'What a lot of rubbish you do scrape together in the course of time!' Then he sat down upon the chest, quite out of breath. He could do no more. "'If only we'd had something to pick us up a little,' he said faintly. "'And it's so dark and gloomy tonight.' "'Help me to get it on my back,' said Pelle, "'and I'll carry it a little way.' Lasse would not at first, but gave in, and they went on again, he running on in front and giving warning of ditches and walls. "'But suppose Brother Kalle can't take us in,' he said suddenly. He's sure to be able to. There's grandmother's bed. That's big enough for two. But suppose we can't get anything to do, then we shall be a burden on him. Oh, we shall get something to do. There's a scarcity of laborers everywhere. Yes, they'll jump at you, but I'm really too old to offer myself out. Lasse had lost all hope and was undermining Pelle's too. I can't do any more, said Pelle, letting the chest down. They stood with arms hanging and stared into the darkness at nothing in particular. Lasse showed no desire to take hold again, and Pelle was now tired out. The night lay dark around them, and its all-enveloping loneliness made it seem as if they too were floating alone in space. "'Well, we ought to be getting on,' exclaimed Pelle, taking a handle of the chest. But as Lasse did not move, he dropped it and sat down. They sat back to back, and neither could find the right words to utter, and the distance between them seemed to increase. Lasse shivered with the night cold. "'If only we were at home in our good bed,' he sighed. Pelle was almost wishing he had been alone, for then he would have gone on to the end. The old man was just as heavy to drag along as the chest. "'Do you know I think I'll go back again?' said Lasse at last, in crestfallen tone. "'I'm afraid I'm not able to tread uncertain paths, and you'll never be confirmed if we go on like this. Suppose we go back, and get Kongstrup to put in a good word for us with the parson.' Lasse stood and held one handle of the chest. Pelle sat on as if he had not heard, and then he silently took hold, and they toiled along on their weary way homeward across the fields. Every other minute Pelle was tired and had to rest. Now that they were going home, Lasse was the more enduring. "'I think I could carry it a little way alone, if you'd help me up with it,' he said, but Pelle would not hear of it. "'Piaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
End of chapter 22「Chapter 23 of Pele the Conqueror, Volume 1, by Martin Anderson Nexo, translated by Jesse Muir. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Sunday morning, between watering and midday feed, Lasse and Pele ascended the high stone steps. They took off their wooden shoes in the passage and stood and shook themselves outside the door of the office. Their gray stocking feet were full of chaff and earth. Lasse raised his hand to knock, but drew it back. "'Have you wiped your nose properly?' he asked in a whisper, with a look of anxiety on his face. Pelle performed the operation once more, and gave a final polish with the sleeve of his blouse. Lasse lifted his hand again. He looked greatly oppressed. "'You might keep quiet, then,' he said irritably to Pelle, who was standing as still as a mouse. Lasse's knuckles were poised in the air two or three times before they fell upon the door, and then he stood with his forehead close to the panel and listened. "'There's no one there,' he whispered irresolutely. "'Just go in,' exclaimed Pelle. "'We can't stand here all day.' "'Then you can go first, if you think you know better how to behave,' said Lasse, offended. Pelle quickly opened the door and went in. There was no one in the office but the door was open into the drawing-room, and the sound of Kongstrup's comfortable breathing came thence. "'Who's there?' he asked. "'It's Lasse and Pelle,' answered Lasse, in a voice that did not sound altogether brave. "'Will you come in here?' Kongstrup was lying on the sofa, reading a magazine, and on the table beside him stood a pile of old magazines and a plateful of little cakes. He did not raise his eyes from the book, not even while his hand went out to the plate for something to put in his mouth. He lay nibbling and swallowing while he read, and never looked at Lasse and Pelle, or asked them what they wanted, or said anything to give them a start. It was like being sent out to plow, without knowing where. He must have been in the middle of something very exciting. "'Well, what do you want?' asked Kongstrup at last, in slow tones. "Well." The master must excuse us for coming like this about something that doesn't concern the farm, but as matters stand now, we've no one else to go to. And so I said to the laddie, Master won't be angry, I'm sure, for he's many a time been kind to us poor beggars, and that. Now, it's so in this world, that even if you're a poor soul that's only fit to do others' dirty work, the Almighty's nevertheless given you a father's heart and it hurts you to see the father's sin standing in the son's way. Lasse came to a standstill. He had thought it all out beforehand, and so arranged it that it should lead up, in a shrewd, dignified way, to the matter itself. But now it was all in a muddle, like a slattern's pocket handkerchief, and the farmer did not look as if he understood a single word of it. He lay there, taking a cake now and then, and looking helplessly toward the door, it sometimes happens, too, that a man gets tired of the single state," began Lasse once more, but at once gave up trying to go on. No matter how he began, he went round and round the thing, and got no hold anywhere. And now Kongstrup began to read again. A tiny question from him might have led to the very middle of it, but he only filled his mouth full and began munching quite hard. Lasse was outwardly disheartened and inwardly angry, as he stood there and prepared to go. Pelle was staring about at the pictures and the old mahogany furniture, making up his mind about each thing. Suddenly energetic steps sounded through the rooms. The ear could follow their course right up from the kitchen. Kongstrup's eyes brightened, and Lasse straightened himself up. "'Is that you too? said Fru Kongstrup, in her decided way that indicated the manager. But do sit down. Why didn't you offer them a seat, old man?" Lasse and Pelle found seats, and the mistress seated herself beside her husband, with her arm leaning upon his pillow. "'How are you getting on, Kongstrup? Have you been resting?' she asked sympathetically, patting his shoulder. Kongstrup gave a little grunt that might have meant yes or no or nothing at all. "'And what about you two? Are you in need of money?' "'No, it's the lad.' 
He's to be dismissed from the confirmation class, answered Lasse simply. With the mistress, you couldn't help being decided. Are you to be dismissed? she exclaimed, looking at Pelle as an old acquaintance. Then what have you been doing? Oh, I kicked the parson's son. And what did you do that for? Because, because he wouldn't fight, but threw himself down. Fru Kongstrup laughed and nudged her husband. Yes, of course, but what had he done to you? He'd said bad things about Father Lasse. What were the things? Pelle looked hard at her. She meant to get to the bottom of everything. I won't tell you, he said firmly. Oh, very well, but then we can't do anything about it either. I may just as well tell you, Lasse interrupted. He called me Madame Olsen's concubine, from the Bible story, I suppose. Kongstrup tried to suppress a chuckle, as if someone had whispered a coarse joke in his ear, and he could not help it. The mistress herself was serious enough. I don't think I understand, she said, and laid a repressing hand on her husband's arm. Lasse must explain. It's because I was engaged to Madame Olsen in the village, who everyone thought was a widow, and then her husband came home the other day, and so they've given me that nickname roundabout, I suppose. Kongstrup began his suppressed laughter again, and Lasse blinked in distress at it. "'Help yourselves to a cake,' said Fru Kongstrup in a very loud voice, pushing the plate toward them. This silenced Kongstrup, and he lay and watched their assault upon the cake plate with an attentive eye. Fru Kongstrup sat tapping the table with her middle finger while they ate. "'So that good boy Pelle got angry and kicked out, did he?' She said suddenly, her eyes flashing. "'Yes, that's what he never ought to have done,' answered Lasse plaintively. Fru Kongstrup fixed her eyes upon him. "'No, for all the poorer birds are for us to be pecked at. Well, I prefer the bird that pecks back again and defends its nest, no matter how poor it is. Well, well, we shall see. And is that boy going to be confirmed?' Why, of course. To think that I should be so forgetful. Then we must begin to think about his clothes. That's two troubles got rid of, said Lasse when they went down to the stable again. And did you notice how nicely I let her know that you were going to be confirmed? It was almost as if she'd found it out for herself. Now you'll see. You'll be as fine as a shop boy in your clothes. People like the master and mistress know what's needed when once they've opened their purse. Well, they got the whole truth straight. But confound it, they're no more than human beings. It's always best to speak out straight. Lasse could not forget how well it had turned out. Pelle let the old man boast. Do you think I shall get leather shoes of them too? he asked. Yes, of course you will and I shouldn't wonder if they made a confirmation party for you too. I say they, but it's her doing it all, and we may be thankful for that. Did you notice that she said we, we shall, and so on, always? It's nice of her, for he only lies there and eats and leaves everything to her. But what a good time he has! I think she'd go through fire to please him, but upon my word, she's master there. Well, well. I suppose we oughtn't to speak evil of any one. To you, she's like your own mother. Fru Kongstrup said nothing about the result of her drive to the parson. It was not her way to talk about things afterward. But Lasse and Pelle once more trod the earth with a feeling of security. When she took up a matter, it was as good as arranged. One morning, later in the week, the tailor came limping in with his scissors, tape measure, and pressing iron, and Pelle had to go down to the servant's room, and was measured in every direction as if he had been a prize animal. Up to the present he had always had his clothes made by guesswork. It was something new to have itinerant artisans at Stone Farm. Since Kongstrup had come into power, neither shoemaker nor tailor had ever set foot in the servant's room. This was a return to the good old farm customs, and placed Stone Farm once more on a footing with the other farms. The people enjoyed it, 
and as often as they could went down into the servant's room for a change of air and to hear one of the tailor's yarns. "'It's the mistress who's at the head of things now,' they said to one another. There was good peasant blood in her hands, and she brought things back into the good old ways. Pelle walked into the servant's room like a gentleman. He was fitted several times a day. He was fitted for two whole suits, one of which was for Rude, who was to be confirmed too. It would probably be the last thing that Rude and his mother would get at the farm, for Fru Kongstrup had carried her point, and they were to leave the cottage in May. They would never venture to set foot again in Stone Farm. Fru Kongstrup herself saw that they received what they were to have, but she did not give money if she could help it. Pelle and Rude were never together now, and they seldom went to the parson together. It was Pelle who had drawn back, as he had grown tired of being on the watch for Rude's continual little lies and treacheries. Pelle was taller and stronger than Rude, and his nature, perhaps because of his physical superiority, had taken more open ways. Inability to master a task or learn it by heart, Rude was also the inferior. But on the other hand, he could bewilder Pelle and the other boys if he only got a hold with his practical common sense. On the great day itself, Karl Johann drove Pelle and Lasse in the little one-horse carriage. "'We're fine folk today,' said Lasse, with a beaming face. He was quite confused, although he had not tasted anything strong. There was a bottle of gin lying in the chest to treat the men when the sacred ceremony was over, but Lasse was not the man to drink anything before he went to church. Pelle had not touched food. God's word would take best effect in that condition. Pelle was radiant, too, in spite of his hunger. He was in brand-new twill, so new that it crackled every time he moved. On his feet he wore elastic-sided shoes that had once belonged to Kongstrup himself. They were too large, but there's no difficulty with a sausage that's too long, as Lasse said. He put in thick soles and paper in the toes, and Pelle put on two pairs of stockings, and then the shoes fitted as if they had been cast for his foot. On his head he wore a blue cap that he had chosen himself down at the shop. It allowed room for growing and rested on his ears, which, for the occasion, were as red as two roses. Round the cap was a broad ribbon in which were woven rakes, scythes, and flails, interlaced with sheaves all the way round. "'It's a good thing you came,' said Pelle, as they drove up to the church and found themselves among so many people. Lasse had almost had to give up the thought of coming, for the man who was going to look after the animals while he was away had to go off at the last moment for the veterinary surgeon. But Karna came and offered to water and give the midday feed, although neither could truthfully say that they had behaved as they ought to have done with her. "'Have you got that thing now?' whispered Lasse when they were inside the church. Pelle felt in his pocket and nodded. The little round piece of lignum vitae that was to carry him over the difficulties of the day lay there. "'Then just answer loud and straight out,' whispered Lasse as he slipped into a pew in the background. Pelle did answer straight out, and to Lasse his voice sounded really well through the spacious church. And the parson did absolutely nothing to revenge himself, but treated Pelle exactly as he did the others. At the most solemn part of the ceremony, Lasse thought of Karna and how touching her devotion was. He scolded himself in an undertone and made a solemn vow. She should not sigh any longer in vain. For a whole month, indeed, Lasse's thoughts had been occupied with Karna, now favorably, now unfavorably. But at this solemn moment, when Pelle was just taking the great step into the future, and Lasse's feelings were touched in so many ways. The thought of Karna's devotion broke over him as something sad, like a song of slighted affection that at last, at last, has justice done to it. Lasse shook hands with Pelle. Good luck and a blessing, he said in a trembling voice. 
The wish also embraced his own vow, and he had some difficulty in keeping silence, respecting his determination. He was so moved. The words were heard on all sides, and Pelle went round and shook hands with his comrades. Then they drove home. "'It all went uncommonly well for you today,' said Lasse proudly. "'And now you're a man, you know.' "'Yes, now you must begin to look about for a sweetheart,' said Karl Johan. Pelle only laughed. In the afternoon they had a holiday. Pelle had first to go up to his master and mistress to thank them for his clothes, and receive their congratulations. Fru Kongstrup gave him red currant wine and cake, and the farmer gave him a two-krona piece. Then they went up to Kala's by the quarry. Pelle was to exhibit himself in his new clothes and say good-bye to them. There was only a fortnight to May Day. Lasse was going to take the opportunity of secretly obtaining information concerning a house that was for sale on the heath. End of chapter 23「They still talked about it every day for the short time that was left. Lasse, who had always had the thought of leaving in his mind, and had only stayed on and on year after year because the boy's welfare demanded it, was slow to move now that there was nothing to hold him back. He was unwilling to lose Pelle, and did all he could to keep him, but nothing would induce him to go out into the world again. "'Stay here,' he said persuasively, "'and we'll talk to the mistress, and she'll take you on for a proper wage. You're both strong and handy, and she's always looked upon you with a friendly eye.' But Pelle would not take service with the farmer, it gave no position and no prospects. He wanted to be something great, and there was no possibility of that in the country. He would be following cows all his days. He would go to the town, perhaps still farther, across the sea to Copenhagen. You'd better come too, he said, and then we shall get rich all the quicker and be able to buy a big farm. Yes, yes, said Lasse, slowly nodding his head. That's one for me and two for yourself. But what the parson preaches doesn't always come to pass. We might become penniless. Who knows what the future may bring? Oh, I shall manage, said Pelle, nodding confidently. Do you mean to say I can't turn my hand to anything I like? And I didn't give notice in time either, said Lasse, to excuse himself. Then run away. But Lasse would not do that. No, I'll stay and work toward getting something for myself about here, he said, a little evasively. It would be nice for you, too, to have a home that you could visit now and then, and if you didn't get on out there, it wouldn't be bad to have something to fall back upon. You might fall ill, or something else might happen. The world's not to be relied upon. You have to have a hard skin all over out there. Pelle did not answer. That about the home sounded nice enough, and he understood quite well that it was Karna's person that weighed down the other end of the balance. Well, she'd put all his clothes in order for his going away, and she'd always been a good soul. He had nothing against that. It would be hard to live apart from Father Lasse, but Pelle felt he must go away. The spring seemed to shout the word in his ears. He knew every rock in the landscape and every tree, yes, every twig on the trees as well. There was nothing more here that could fill his blue eyes and long ears and satisfy his mind. The day before May Day they packed Pelle's things. Lasse knelt before the green chest. Every article was carefully folded and remarked upon, before it was placed in the canvas bag that was to serve Pelle as a traveling trunk. Now remember not to wear your stockings too long before you mend them, said Lasse, putting mending wool on one side. He who mends his things in time is spared half the work and all the disgrace. I shan't forget that, said Pelle quietly. Lasse was holding a folded shirt in his hand. The one you've got on's just been washed, 
he said reflectively. But one can't tell. Two shirts'll almost be too little if you're away, won't they? You must take one of mine. I can always manage to get another by the time I want to change. And remember, you must never go longer than a fortnight. You who are young and healthy might easily get vermin and be jeered at by the whole town. Such a thing would never be tolerated in anyone who wants to get on. At the worst, you can do a little washing or yourself. You could go down to the shore in the evening, if that was all. Do they wear wooden shoes in the town? asked Pelle. Not people who want to get on. I think you'd better let me keep the wooden shoes, and you take my boots instead. They always look nice, even if they're old. You'd better wear them when you go tomorrow, and save your good shoes. The new clothes were laid at the top of the bag, wrapped in an old blouse to keep them clean. Now I think we've got everything in, said Lasse, with a searching glance into the green chest. There was not much left in it. Very well, we'll tie it up in God's name, and pray that you may arrive safely, wherever you decide to go. Lasse tied up the sack. He was anything but happy. You must say good-bye nicely to everyone on the farm, so that they won't have anything to scratch my eyes out for afterward, said Lasse, after a little. And I should like you to thank Karna nicely for having put everything in such good order. It isn't everyone who'd have bothered. Yes, I'll do that, said Pelle, in a low voice. He did not seem to be able to speak out properly today. Pelle was up and dressed at daybreak. Mist lay over the sea, and prophesied well for the day. He went about well scrubbed and combed, and looked at everything with wide open eyes and with his hands in his pockets. The blue clothes which he had gone to his confirmation classes in had been washed and newly mangled, and he still looked very well in them, and the tabs of the old leather boots, which were a relic of Lasse's prosperous days, stuck out almost as much as his ears. He said his good-bye and thank you for all your kindness to everybody on the farm, even Eric, and he had had a good meal of bacon. Now he was going about the stable, collecting himself, shaking the bull by the horns, and letting the calves suck his fingers. It was a sort of farewell, too. The cows put their noses close up to him, and breathed a long, comfortable breath when he passed, and the bull playfully tossed its head at him. And close behind him went Lasse. He did not say very much, but he always kept near the boy. It was so good to be here and the feeling sank gently over Pelle every time a cow licked herself, or the warm vapor rose from freshly falling dung. Every sound was like a mother's caress, and everything was a familiar toy, with which a bright world could be built. Upon the posts all round were pictures that he had cut upon them. Lasse had smeared them over with dirt again, in case the farmer should come and say they were spoiling everything. Pelle was not thinking, but went about in a dreamy state. It all sank so warmly and heavily into his child's mind. He had taken out his knife and took hold of the bull's horn, as if he were going to carve something on it. "'He won't let you do that,' said Lasse, surprised. "'Try one of the bullocks instead.' But Pelle returned his knife to his pocket. He had not intended to do anything— he strolled along the foddering passage without aim or object. Lasse came up and took his hand. "'You'd better stay here a little longer,' he said. "'We're so comfortable.' But this put life into Pelle. He fixed his big, faithful eyes upon his father, and then went down to their room. Lasse followed him. "'In God's name, then, if it has to be,' he said huskily, and took hold of the sack to help Pelle get it onto his back. Pelle held out his hand. Goodbye, and thank you, father, for all your kindness, he added gently. Yes, 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 said Lasse, shaking his head. It was all he was able to say. He went out with Pelle past the outhouses, and there stopped, while Pelle went along the dikes with his sack on his back up toward the high road. 
Two or three times he turned and nodded. Lasse, overcome, stood gazing, with his hand shading his eyes. He had never looked so old before. Out in the fields they were driving the seed harrow. Stone Farm was early with it this year. Kongstrup and his wife were strolling along arm in arm beside a ditch. Every now and then they stopped and she pointed. They must have been talking about the crop. She leaned against him when they walked. She had really found rest in her affection now. Now Lasse turned and went in. How forlorn he looked. Pelle felt a quick desire to throw down the sack and run back and say something nice to him. But before he could do so, the impulse had disappeared upon the fresh morning breeze. His feet carried him upon the straight way. Away, away. Up on a ridge, the bailiff was stepping out a field, and close behind him walked Eric, imitating him with foolish gestures. On a level with the edge of the rocks, Pelle came to the wide high road. Here, he knew, Stone Farm and its lands would be lost to sight, and he put down his sack. There were the sandbanks by the sea, with every treetop visible. There was the fir tree that the yellow hammer always built in. The stream ran milk white after the heavy thaw, and the meadow was beginning to grow green. But the cairn was gone. Good people had removed it secretly when Niels Kohler was drowned and the girl was expected out of prison. And the farm stood out clearly in the morning light, with its high white dwelling house, the long range of barns, and all the outhouses. Every spot down there shone so familiarly toward him. The hardships he had suffered were forgotten, or only showed up the comforts in stronger relief. Pelle's childhood had been happy by virtue of everything. It had been a song mingled with weeping. Weeping falls into tones as well as joy, and heard from a distance it becomes a song. And as Pelle gazed down upon his childhood's world, they were only pleasant memories that gleamed toward him through the bright air. Nothing else existed, or ever had done so. He had seen enough of hardship and misfortune, but had come well out of everything. Nothing had harmed him. With a child's veracity he had found nourishment in it all, and now he stood here, healthy and strong, equipped with the prophets, the judges, the apostles, the Ten Commandments, and one hundred and twenty hymns, and turned an open, perspiring, victor's brow toward the world. Before him lay the land, sloping richly toward the south, bounded by the sea. Far below stood two tall black chimneys against the sea as background, and still farther south lay the town. Away from it ran the paths of the sea to Sweden and Copenhagen. This was the world, the great wide world itself. Pelle became ravenously hungry at the sight of the great world, and the first thing he did was to sit down upon the ridge of the hill, with a view both backward and forward and eat all the food Karna had given him for the whole day, so his stomach would have nothing more to trouble about. He rose refreshed, got the sack onto his back, and set off downward to conquer the world, pouring forth a song at the top of his voice into the bright air as he went. A stranger I must wander among the Englishmen, with African black negroes my lot it may be thrown, and then upon this earth there are Portuguese found too, and every kind of nation under heaven's sky so blue. The End of Pele the Conqueror, Volume 1 By Martin Anderson Nexo Translated by Jesse Muir